Okay, welcome everyone. And thank you um, for all being here. And for those of you where it's past midnight where you are, thank you especially for staying up so late. Um, why don't each of you just give us a 20 second introduction, tell us your name, your latest book, what you've been doing the last 20 years, just a quick intro so I can go to questions just so everyone can hear your voice and know who you are. Uh, let's do it, I'll give you the order so we can uh, have a system so we can go Udo, you can go first, and then Dr. Hellman, then Brian Clement, then Dr. Cousins, and then Dr. Delgado. That's how it is on my screen. So why don't we go in that order? Uh, you're muted, Doc, uh, Udo. Okay. Okay, there you go. Okay. So uh, I, I'm working on turning 80 this year. Um, it's been taking me a long time. And uh, I, but I'm working on turning human nature and health into teachable fields based in nature and human nature. That's been my project for, uh, for quite a long time now. And I'm just whittling away at it. Uh, and uh, I'm under a little pressure to get it done because when you turn 80, that's a sign. But when I was 56, I didn't feel I was mature enough to, to do it yet. Thank you. All right, so my name's Dr. Josh Hellman. I've got two degrees from Harvard, two degrees in biochemistry. And right now I'm focused on fasting and treating Lyme disease, mold toxicity, long COVID, brain fog resulting from all those. And um, it's a pleasure to be here, so. And, and my website's drjosh.com, drjosh.com. Thank you. And uh, for, if you want more information on all of these gentlemen on our website, they have a bio and you click the bio and it'll take you to their website. And if you click on our bookstore, it'll take you to their books. Go ahead, Brian. I'm the director of the Faculty Health Institute uh, for the last 42 years. And I began working with this institute back in 1975. And I'm blessed because my wife is a co-director and really the brains behind Hippocrates. So it's nice to be with you and we're acutely interested in health and longevity. We'll have a lot to talk about tonight. Thank you. Dr. Cousins? Yes, so um, my name is Dr. Gabriel Cousins. I'm a work pretty much as a holistic a physician, family therapist and spiritual teacher. We just moved to Israel. My latest book was, is Into the Nothing, which is a spiritual autobiography. Uh, I have taught in over 42 different countries, and my focus is enduring radiant health. Um, and I use myself as the main object here to experiment on. So I've kind of consistently hit at the age of 79, 2,000 push-ups all at one time, et cetera, because uh, there is a way to actually, I won't even use the word reduce, reduce aging uh, process, but enhance the aging process to get better mentally and physically. So that's a, what I'm gonna, uh, a living example that I try to be of. Thank you. Dr. Nick Delgado here, graduate of USC, Loma Linda University, Cal State LA. I achieved becoming Nathan Pritikin's co-director at the Pritikin Longevity Center. And I went on to write in anti-aging medical therapeutics, several papers on stem cells, rejuvenation. I've been plant-based, oil-free, sugar-free for 45 years. I've broken two world strength endurance records against men, not my age, 67, but against men 20 and 30 years old on steroids, and I crushed them. I enjoy sharing my passion, my goals, and my newest book of 15 books I've written is Disease Hacking, and it's available only as an ebook uh, when you go to our website and request it. We are excited because my next world record will be to break the world record for healthy aging. I will be the longest lived healthiest individual in history. I'm already en route to do that. And with that being said, within 50 years, I question Gene Calumet's uh, record because 
it looks like Smithsonian Institute passed on a birth certificate regarding her mother. But even if that is, I still will end up making love to a beautiful woman on my 117th birthday. And uh, that should prove that I'm in great health. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let me get you up to speed. Um, we've been having the Real Truth About Health free 17-day live online conference. This is day 10. Um, from 9 a.m. till 7 p.m., we have uh, five different individual lectures, then a panel in the evening. The speakers that we have are very good. They're cardiologists, they're medical doctors, they're researchers, they're authors, they're nutritionists, they're dietitians. They've gone to the best schools in the country. They have excellent credentials. They're fantastic. We love them. And they are saying things different than what you are saying. They speak just as confidently. They have just as much of an MD after their name. They all are terrific and we love them. They are not saying the same thing. And the audience is now at the point where they're saying, this is a really fun conference. This is really nice, but really smart people are saying different things. And it doesn't matter how confident the speaker is. At this point, we're kind of saying, well, what's the proof? What, what is the basis behind what everyone is saying? So the first question I want to ask everyone is, you know, remember, the only we're not really that interested in all the details. We want to know how to prevent disease. That's all we're really interested. How the pancreas works is not what the, the audience is that interested in. We want to know how do we stay healthy? We hate these diseases, and we just want to know the bottom line. So the first question is, we want to understand what we're supposed to eat. And what we've been told so far is one group has said, eat a whole food, plant-based diet, and do not have a lot of fat at all. Minimum avocados, minimum nuts and seeds, um, minimum raw olives, and definitely no oil. Another group has said, yes, it's okay to have avocados and nuts and seeds and, and olives, but definitely no oil. Another group is saying there's absolutely you know, no reason to eat raw food. You get all the benefits you need from cooked vegetables and cooked beans and grains, and you don't have to be raw at all. Um, and, you know, and then some people are saying, no matter what, avoid salt. And we're a little confused and we are still trying to understand we just want to avoid cancer and heart disease and dementia and the other diseases. And we really are still just to want to understand what we should do. And then what are you basing it on? Because if you say, no, 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 the studies all say it's great to do this. Well, why they're saying something different and they really seem smart too. So it would be great if each of you could tell us what should we eat if we want to avoid diseases and What's the basis why you're saying this? Are you just saying this because that's what you believe? Is there a study? Is there 10 studies? Like what is the, the hardcore foundation that you are saying something that a lot of people aren't? So if each of you would share your thoughts, that would be great. And we could go in the same order um, of, of, uh, um, of Udo and then Dr. Hellman, then Brian, then Gabriel, then Dr. Delgado. <clears throat> Okay, for me, I, I grew up on a l largely plant-based diet, but we had meat in the diet, but we lived on a farm without electricity, so we only had it once a week because we had to go into town to get it out of a freezer. And so, uh, so and we had lots of dairy product. It was fresh. We got it fresh from the farm, unpasteurized. That's kind of how I grew up. We all were on a farm where we cleared 40 acres by hand and by horse. So we were physically very active and we didn't really think about eating. We had a huge garden with vegetables. We grew on a lot of our own vegetables. Uh, as I get older, I've liked uh, animal based products less and less. I find that as I get older, plant based works better and better for me. And I'm doing that strictly by my own personal experience. And I'm now to the point where I'm pretty much I, I would say close to 95% raw food. So, f and basically in my view, of course, looking at nature, fresh, whole, raw, organic, and local was, was life's mandate for creatures to eat. 
and I'm going closer. You know, I, I always look at how was it in nature before we got civilized. That's where I get a lot of my information from. Now, the research is also clear. Whole food, plant-based is, is if you want the longest life and the best health, mm. and that's what you should be eating, and you should take a B12 supplement. And I'm pretty much doing that. I do take supplements, and of course, I use oils because, <laughs> because I'm the fat man. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but fundamentally, what should I eat? I eat mostly plant-based and uh, most of it raw. Of course, if the food is contaminated, then you have to kill the bugs on it. So uh, that would be the, the reason, the only reason why raw would not make more sense. And when you eat raw, you get enzymes in the food that help digest the food. So it's easier on your digestive system once you're used to it. You get probiotics on the foods if you're getting them from a natural source. And none of the amino acids, the sensitive ones or the minerals get lost or any of the nutrients get lost because when we cook our foods and especially if we fry them, we lose some of the nutrients and we actually make some molecules toxic. So frying is the dumbest thing we ever invented to do to our food ever in 200,000 years. So that's, that's my, my stick. Thank you. Yeah. So, so my opinion is I, I go with whole food, plant-based plants. And I look through, at things through a toxin perspective. And I know from the studies, the higher up you go on the food chain, land or sea, if, if you're eating you know, cows or fish, the higher up you go, the higher the toxin level. So our goal, if we want to be healthy, is to decrease our toxin level, which means eating down, eating, eating plants. So, and, and there's good science, you know, if you, if you compare the toxin level from vegans to non-vegans, the vegans will have 10 times lower toxin levels than the people who eat, you know, animal products. So that's number one. Number two, I am not a fan of adding salt, oil, or sugar based on the damage those things can do to your blood vessels. And then finally, I find I have more energy when I eat mainly raw, and I can see how there will be more nutrients like isocyanates that, that would be decomposed if you cook them. But then again, what I would say is see how you feel, do the experiment, eat completely raw, eat 50% raw, you know, and see. And um, yeah, so that's my perspective. Thank you. So to your point, uh, Stephen, uh, back when all of we men who are on this panel were little boys, the Institute stores opened in the mid 1950s. And since then, we've worked with hundreds of thousands of people on our campuses, which were originally in Boston. And we had a lot of people who were volunteering with us from Tufts and Harvard and Boston College and BU, Boston University. And we were doing research at night when the academics would go home in the laboratories of some of these institutions. But more importantly, when you do something in a clinical setting, when you actually, in our case, have the sickest people in the world come here. Brian, you got muted. You, you're muted. You're muted. Still can't hear you. Is there some way to unmute Brian? Let's see. Brian, we can't hear you. Well, should I go and, ahead and, oh, and fix Okay, yeah. so Gabriel, you go ahead and we'll come back to you, Brian, after. Okay, so I part of my background is a, as a um, National Football Hall of Fame uh, football player and captain of an undefeated Amherst College uh, football team. Why do I say that? Because the best... Uh, Basically, the best way to play is to have a really strong offense. Okay. Now, if you're going to have a strong offense, I don't look at food from a defensive point of view. I look at it as how do I maximize? So at 21, when I was playing football, I could do 70 push ups and 500 sit ups and Pretty in seven pull-ups. So here at 79, 
I I mentioned 2,000 push-ups on a regular basis, 900 sit-ups, and up to 100 pull-ups. How did that happen? Okay, so uh, in 1973, I switched to a vegan diet, and then over a period of time, when I wrote my first book in 1986, which is a 100% live food diet. So what are the results? Okay, here I am 59 years later doing uh, 2,000 push-ups versus 70 push-ups. How did that happen? So one of the things that's key to this process is how to individualize your diet. We aren't a bunch of cows who eat grass. So on chromosome 19, it says how much carbohydrate, how much protein, how much fat you should have. About 30% of uh, the population needs a lower protein diet and 70% need a higher protein diet. Low protein, high protein, what are we talking about? 35 grams to 70 grams a day is like the optimum range. We call it the mTOR pathway, anti-cancer, but also longevity. So once we kind of get that, then you have to ask the next question is with age, your protein needs differ. So at age 45, uh, you need less protein than you do when you're 65. So at 65, I was stuck at 25 pull-ups. I added one tablespoon of protein concentrate, and over a period of uh, a month or two, I went up to 100 pull-ups. That's called individualizing your diet and adjusting your diet according to your life cycle. So these are very important things. We, and I'm a person that didn't need a lot of protein. I was just like having you know, 8%. And then when I upped it, and I was stuck at 25 push-ups, and I upped it to 10%. I'm not, I'm not up. I went up to like 100 pull-ups. So I'm measuring it that, oh, this is unique. This one, it's, briefly, right, and it's me. So we have to become the researcher on ourselves when we're really talking about the optimum diet. There's no one optimum diet for everyone. We need I just want a hard one, to be man. a researcher on ourselves, and that's the key. So again, 70% need a higher protein, 30% need a lower protein, and again, fat need, and also your, your carbohydrate need is going to vary according to your physio physiology. It's outlined in chromosome 19, where the research was done at Stanford University about that. So that's kind of an overview, but where the really the person, each person has to individualize their diet as intelligently as possible, plus by trial and error. Thank you. Brian, you want to continue? Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to take a short break there. <laughs> So what I was saying is, you know, when you work with hundreds of thousands of people over a seven decade period, you learn a lot. You may come into this as we did in 1956 with an idea. And thank God our founder had an infinite wisdom that wasn't from an intellectual uh, or academic background. She had healed herself of advanced cancer. So she was spiritually awake. And she recognized that we had to eat raw food and not only raw food, but germinated nuts, seeds, grains, and beans. Now there was little to no science back seven decades ago about that, but now we have volumes of science. I write for the academics about them. I've done three volume series called Food is Medicine, and it gives the scientific backbone to why this has worked. So thousands of people have healed disease, and those of us that live this way as we're talking, uh, Gabriel just spoke about that. We just don't age the way the rest of the population does. I'm now in my 70s, and honestly, I'm not here to promote anyone or myself. I feel like a 20-year-old boy, and that's not a, a joke. It's interesting, Gabriel said something I didn't know about him, and we've been colleagues for a long time, that I do 900 sit-ups a day also. 
And I was only doing 850, but I said, what the hell, let's push it to 900 recently. So we don't come to go back to your original question from reading only empirical evidence, science, or what other people say. And I understand a lot of these doctors who say eat oil, don't eat oil, they don't have a depth of, of experience. They may have personally gotten themselves well. They may work with individuals in a private practice and see 10 people a day. Uh, it's different when you have groups of 100 people come in and our medical team observes them and we do blood tests and we do very elaborate scans on them. Uh, we're do doing variable heart rates now, which is really amazing to see what that does uh, to monitor the brain and the heart. And there's so many factors to living a healthy life. We'll get to that later. Thank you. Thank you. The power of the mind and love and connection has been proven by the blue zones talking about happiness and longevity. The power of sleep is undeniably important. The power of the use of herbs and supplements to balance out your hormones, something I've done and I've monitored tens of thousands of people because I test somewhere between 100 and in Tony Robbins events up to a thousand people in a weekend. So I've fo followed those people for 20 years or more. I can show you lab work that it'd be interesting because when you're talking about daily workouts, in 12 minutes, I work out in one hour, I do over 1000 lifts nonstop with no rest. There is no athlete in the world, except for about five athletes that have ever been able to keep up with me in the world. When you look at my testosterone, 1,580, my free testosterone is of a youthful 29 year old, like my son, who's a MMA fighter. I am able to show you my lipid levels with uh, a level that would astonish you because I've maintained since I was director with Nathan Pritikin, a triglyceride of 76, a cholesterol of 134, an HDL of 41, an LDL of 78. I truly will break the world record for healthy aging because I understand over 38 different hormones and 100 metabolites that have to be balanced. And I check myself and my clients, including Mark Victor Hansen, Ty Lopez, Tony Robbins, uh, the most elite people in the world come to me when they find out that I am the one who has figured out the code to aging and reversing aging. When you can make love to your girlfriend every day and every night, when you can sustain not a sexless marriage, but a high energy profile that keeps up through the demands of stress, COVID, and everything else we face, then I would purport to you the 15 stem cell treatments with millions of cord blood stem cells and now Wharton's jelly that I use myself. And for those elect, uh, lucky clients that we have come through by personal evaluation. And, and in terms of the diet, there is no denying that when I've looked for 45 years at tens of thousands of people, I produced a video, how to become diabetic in six hours. That video went uh, viral because I showed that my clean, basic plant-based, oil-free, sugar-free, low protein by most standards of 20 to 60 grams of protein a day builds fabulous muscles with the right intensity and the right training and the right hormone balance. The truth is oil should be eaten as whole nuts, seeds, avocados, olives. I lend to you the same reason why we don't eat sugar separately. Why would you eat it separately in the form of oils? You have nuts, seeds, avocados, olives. I do not restrict them. We've seen keto diets on plant-based with whole food, not oils, perform quite well with cardiovascular disease and so forth. So I would tell you that when you have in real time a microscope, as I use on all my clients and every doctor I train, you will see the truth and no longer be marred or misled by emotion or personal belief. You have to put it to the test. And I will tell you now that over uh, $1,000 worth of my cost of lab work is way beyond LabCorp request. I use Access Lab. So when we test all of these hormones and lab levels in if I find my pregnenolone is dropping or my DHA level is dropping or my estrogen is too high, I adjust for it because I know exactly what to do. So if you're going to break the world record for healthy aging, you can't put it to chance. You're going to have to put it to the test and not just yourself, but tens of thousands of clients that I guide and coach on a weekly mentorship type program. So I'm excited to share this panel because you are all learned men. I've shared the panel over the years many times, and I usually have a position that's very focused 
and exciting because I've helped over 50,000 young kids clear up their acne. I know the same program that helps them to clear up their skin will help them to reduce the risk of cancer. The big killers is what we're concerned about. Michael Greger, uh, John McDougall, each of these people, uh, Bob Goldman, are endorsing my new book, Disease Hacking. 25 chapters, 12 years in the writing. I'd love to share it with the world. It talks about peptides, hormones, stem cells, advanced therapeutics, neuromuscular stimulation, uh, using alternating current, and everything that we do lends to a strong, fit, healthy body, mind, career, relationships, and health. So love you all. Okay, just, just so we're clear <clears throat> on the two first two major questions. Oh, it's everyone saying that despite what all these other plant-based cardiologists saying about fat, that you believe they're not correct and that it is okay to have raw seeds, raw nuts, olive, raw olives, and avocados. So is any, uh, you know, question one, is everyone saying it's okay to eat that? Is anyone saying that any of this can cause cardiovascular quant problems if you have too much? And then question two, again, are you saying that oils is something we should... Um, try to avoid, try to add, it's neutral. So just clearly focus on those two things for a second so we could all try to put this to rest. I'll just simply- Because uh, I am saying that, that uh, because we've done that. You know, people uh, who are lacking essential fats end up with problems. And if you want data, uh, there's volumes of data on that. And I know that many of the cardiovascularly uh, inclined doctors rightfully are concerned about what happens with exceptional fat in the interior part of the vein, which creates an inflammatory condition. But remember, uh, this is not in a vacuum. And I completely concur with what you just said a minute ago. Uh, you know, if you're not realizing that longevity and health starts with the mind, uh, this whole conversation is fraudulent then. And so let's go, go to that stage. And I have gentlemen uh, mostly who have matured and worked in the field of healthcare in most of our cases for 40, 50 years. And as a nutritional guy, I would like to tell you if you change a diet, everyone gets well, but I did that with people who died, uh, even if they ate healthy food because they had a negative attitude and nobody helped them, and nobody worked with them. Everyone here gets psychotherapy. Uh, do I think stimulation, by the way, is important? We're the first institute in history that has an energy medicine department. I just brought new equipment in two weeks ago. That is incredibly helpful. Do I think stem cells? We've been working with stem cell doctors here for 25 years. Uh, with very severe cases, we actually send them with cancer. And for people with joint problems, we send them to a different doctor. He used to work with the NFL. Do we think exercise is important? Uh, you have an option here to either go to the gym, which is open you know, 20 hours a day, or go to one of our 10 classes a day, seven days a week here. We encourage this. And it's unfortunate when we talk about diet, uh, everyone thinks if I just change my food, I'm gonna get better. It just doesn't work that easy. Thank you. Yeah, so so I I would disagree uh, respectfully that you know I, I don't think that that oil should be part of your diet normally. Now I understand if if you check your you know your your omega three levels, your DHA and EPA, and they're low, sure maybe you need to supplement those. But in general, I don't think oil should be part of your diet. Um, I, I mean, I'm okay with essential oils, but that's another issue. I'm okay with topical oil on painful joints or on your hair, but no, I don't think oil should be part of a normal diet because of the damage it does to the surface of red blood cells, which in turn will damage the lining of your arteries when, when, when the blood throws through it. And it's the same type of damage that it's the same type of damage we see with other fatty toxins like mold toxins. The yeah, but, red blood but let's cells get back to some. Are, Start, far, start yeah. forming spikes. So, but, on that but, point, that's, I but but here's what I have to say to you. I grew up doing this. It's my 52nd year. I've seen lots of vegans lose their memory. I've seen lots of vegans age prematurely, and this is something that Dr. Furman and I share. He grew up doing this too. So you can't 
I don't know what you can do. I just would prefer that you stay open-minded. I know Dr. Esselstyn has been had, had a major influence and I love Dr. Esselstyn. We've been on lecture tours to Europe together, but he come through the window of cardiovascular health. And I'm coming through the window of, some of our guests have been coming here for longer than I've been the director. And I've watched these people. Now they're 90 years old, 105 years old. And I've watched these people. And if they're not taking B12 supplements that are proper, and if they're not taking enough essential fats in their diet, they all end up losing memory. Right. No question. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is you don't want to use fat at light. I mean, I'm okay with an ounce here, an ounce there throughout the day. But if you're eating avocados, nuts, and seeds unlimited, I see too much people. Patients you said it's unlimited. unlimited. Nobody said that. And the other thing I'm saying is you don't get DHA from all of those at high levels. So I strongly advise people take an algae-based supplement because that's where I can be assured a person's not going to have uh, the neuron dysfunction that happens from pathways shutting down because of a lack of DHA. Dr. Cousins, Udo, um, Dr. Delgado, again, one more time, do we need oil itself or do we just need fat? And do we actually need fat in the form of seeds, nuts, raw seeds, raw nuts, raw olives and avocados and, so and, and specifically oil? Going back to the idea that we're unique beings and we aren't a bunch of cows and we have different physiologies. That's one level. Second is the mental state. And there has been research where people uh, go back, they're, they're 30 years out of high school and they go back and they play the high school music and they do this and, you know, a high school mindset and they decrease in their age in one week, you know, up to, up to about 10 years. So the mental state is very important, but I want to get back to your question. So I'm a person who can't eat a lot of fat, okay? It doesn't work for me. I can have a half an avocado and that works really well. And I have a certain amount of nuts and seeds that works really well. But if I have too much, then it doesn't work well. And that's too much protein. Nuts and seeds is the main source of protein. So we got to get the fact that we're unique individuals in this discussion. Now, free oil is different than oil that's in food. And I think that's a little bit of the confusion here, I think. So I don't really recommend free oil, but I do recommend you know, some people taking a half to a full avocado and a certain amount of nuts and seeds. I don't need a lot personally because I'm what we call fast, uh, slow oxidizer. They need more, a little bit more carbohydrate, which my carbohydrate comes from salads. Okay. And then of course you have spinach, it's 49% Protein, of course, you have to eat a bushel of that, but that's a different issue there, okay? But the, the point I'm making is I don't do so well with uh, a lot of fat, a lot of protein, so I have a lower amount of that, and I end up having more of the you know natural carbohydrate, like with vegetables, and, and a touch of, it's like citrus fruit a little bit. So that's the point I'm making. I'm not talking about free oils. That's a different issue. I don't really recommend much of that in, in the big picture. But foods that have oil, different thing. According to your constitution, according to chromosome 19, we are unique individuals. So I think that's part of what confuses the argument. You get something that works. That's, you know, I'm, I'm gonna just say something like Brian said, we know that people who do not get enough fat don't their minds don't work as well and i also use dha as a key supplement for building the brain function and maintaining cognition i also see if your cholesterol gets too low you actually have a drop in cognition abilities and memory abilities so there's a few pieces here that we have to understand so to me, a cholesterol less than 150 isn't very safe because of all kinds of other things that go on. 
So that's another perspective. All, so all Brian and Udo, um, are you guys saying that we should specifically <laughs> eat oil or are you saying we should make sure to get fat from seeds, nuts, avocados, and raw olives? Or are you saying no, specifically for your health, you want chia, flax, hemp, olive oil? Are you saying that we should try to get that in our diet? Or are you saying as long as you get it from seeds, nuts, raw olives, and avocados, it's okay? I, I'm trying to go last so that I so that I know what kind of a weight I'm going to have to lift out of the water here, <laughs> because I, I I use both oils in seeds and oils separate from seeds, but there's a whole other issue that's being completely forgotten in this conversation so far, but I'd like to hear from Dr. Delgado before I do that. I uploaded uh, something that I've worked on for three years from the doctors.com forward slash Pritikin. He was the first to really identify the concern about oils. And what he said was not that the oils themselves were uh, problematic. It was that they act mechanically. They simply, according to Dr. Meyer Friedman, type A, type B personality uh, cardiologist stated that the oils literally coat the blood cells. And when they come to the capillary beds, which I've seen this tens of thousands of times. The red blood cells are nine microns. The capillaries are seven microns. So the red cells have to bend backwards and squeeze through to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. If there's a little bit of oil coating them, and trust me, at the head of a pin, there's 8 million red blood cells. So you can, just by consuming separated oils into the gut, go through the lymphatic system, to the bloodstream, and gum up the entire immune system within six hours. I've demonstrated this time and again. This could be demonstrated, a good scientific study, a good theory, now becomes science. And what we know is that there's a limit. And yes, if you put a little teaspoon of oil and it goes in, because oil is difficult to metabolize. The number one fuel of the body is first glucose. It burns with water, which you excrete, and carbon dioxide, which you exhale. If you burn protein, it burns with 30% waste Product is very inefficient. As an athlete, I have to be careful of fuels I take in, whereas fat has about seven to nine percent waste product, which is ketones, ketoacidosis. It's not a preferred source of energy, it's a default. So if you're going to fuel the body, world class athletes like um, Dorian Yates, uh, like Lee Haney, particularly, eight time Mr. U, uh, Mr. Olympiad eats 500 grams of complex carbohydrates a day with about 60 to 80 grams of protein a day and somewhere in the mid range of whole fats. I eat whole fats, but I will use oils because Bernardo Lapello lived beyond uh, that lofty age because there's right now I'm told about only four people in the world past 111. So millions of people can reach past uh, 100, but he would rub oil all over his skin, olive oil. I use various oils rubbed on my skin at night to reduce uh, wrinkles and help the layers of the skin. It doesn't absorb much into the general circulation of lymphatics. It just helps the outer layer of the skin, which is, I think, a healthy thing. So I do eat a, a reasonable amount of nuts, seeds, avocados, all so long as they're soaked, so they're alive, uh, lending to Brian's concept of live whole food and raw food. And there's every evidence shows increased vitamins, minerals, nutrients, antioxidants uh, when you cook them. But we know the brain size improved after cooking because it wasn't the advent of animal product into the human diet. It was cooking so we could get enough calories so we didn't have to forage and eat all day long. I do carry food with me every single day every day for 45 years. I don't leave it to chance. I always have whole natural food. Cooked beans are excellent. The longest lived people in the world eat cooked beans. Oil is necessary, but in its package and absorbed safely and simply into the digestive gut. I measure people with three avocados and their blood is mucked up. They're vegetarian and they're tired and fatigued. I got them down to half avocado a day because they're not as athletic as I am. And they basically then thrive. So fatigue is commonly complaining why everyone drinks coffee. I don't, I don't need coffee, but they use it because they have so much oil coursing through their bloodstream. Get rid of the excess oils coursing through the blood, just like the excess sugars. Although you can live on a glucose IV, Dr. Felbel did an IV with fat. And within one hour, he caused these people to test diabetic because fat desensitizes insulin. Their ergo, the excess fat is true, according to the cardiologist and Dr. James Anderson, the world-renowned endocrinologist who first enlightened uh, Pritikin, Pritikin enlightened him and uh, Michael Gregor 
in all of us. So we know, again, back to whole food is exactly the way we were designed as humans. Oil came about in 1914, a cold press process. It was not normal to be able to track that amount of oil into the diet. Humans evolved millions of years. You looked at human feces, 10, 20 million years. They ate plant-based foods, not animal foods. And if they did, it was an occasion. So we, we are able to eat like a cockroach. We're able to eat anything like McDougal states. But I know they have leaned heavily because they wanted to go fat-free, oil-free. And I talked to um, Caldwell Esselstyn directly in an interview. And he said, well, listen, if I allow them three nuts, they'll take six nuts, they'll take 12. No, just tell them, like Joel Furman, tell them exactly how many nuts and seeds and avocados and olives they can eat. Just don't leave it a chance. They do need the fats, but don't go excessive. And that's the key because the blood is what suffers first. And it, it stays gummed up with triglycerides. I can prove it 100 times out of 100 times in every one of you. On a clean diet, I could infuse that fat by IV, by through your diet, but through your skin, you're safe. If you're eating separated oils, don't do it. Stop. Yeah, sludge blood is not good for you. I have an awful lot to say. I've been listening, and there's a lot of, of great jewels that everyone's bringing up here. Number one, uh, we don't just at random tell people they can eat all the fats and all the nuts and the seeds that they want. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw just one month ago, University of Chicago reported a study on women's uh, abdominal fat and basically showed when they ate more avocado, they lost more weight, where men it didn't work for. So you've got to keep up with these studies. I don't know why, you know, that's perplexing to me. Uh, Udo basically so single-handedly, Udo single-handedly to the world uh, got us to be awake to essential fatty acids and the congratulation to him. Because again, I'll repeat, I have observed hundreds and hundreds of people on a pure plant-based diet who didn't take any oils and didn't take any fats and didn't get DHA, who basically have dementia. Now, this isn't an opinion. This is a report I'm giving you at this point. <clears throat> Recently okay, so in mainstream literature, they're showing that people who, by the way, are 100 years old, centenarians, generally have higher amounts of lipids within their bloodstream. And I have a hypothesis, I don't know how right this is, when you're younger, if this happens to you, you're more prone for cardiovascular and diabetic conditions, but somehow your metabolism slows down when you get in your 70s, 80s, and 90s, and seemingly, uh, when they test 100-year-old people, they generally almost all of them have high lipid profiles. Now, these are things you should look up. I mean, now, do I think that everything is true, that you may inflame the in, in, internal part of the capillary, which is so small, it's microscopic, by eating too much oil? Yeah, yes. And do I think that Dr. Esselstyn and his team of people that surround him and love what he's saying are right when you just had a heart attack or stroke or phlebitis? It's a good thing not to take any oil to get those capillaries moving again and, and veins. Yeah, but we, I, I would rather have everyone take this into account. And on the last statement I'll make is we do blood tests on people. They come here with outrageously high amounts of you know, cholesterol and triglycerides and low high density lipids. And they're eating, you know, I tell them don't eat it. Our doctors here basically say, don't eat a lot of fat or don't eat any, they're doing it anyway. The other thing we're not taking into account here, these people are coming from meat diets, dairy diets. And we all at once come in like food Nazis and we say to them, you can't eat any fat. Well, for most of these people, that's not realistic. You know, and I've worked personally with 287,000 people, you know, generally for three weeks. It's not realistic. It wasn't realistic for me. I was gonna go from pork chops to spinach. No, I needed lots of fat at that point. Was it healthy for me? But it was. I was capable of maintaining the lifestyle by doing that. And then in reference to what uh, Gabriel said, I completely concur, there's different metabolisms. So there's some people that literally have massive needs for lots of fat. And I don't know the data that you're talking about, Doc, but the fact of the matter is, you say it's the least uh, way we get energy is fat. I'm not sure, there's some cultures, you look at the work of Dr. Hal, going back to the Eskimos, all they eat is fat. Now, I'm not saying they're healthy, they're dying in their 50s and 60s, but that's the only energy they have. So I've seemingly there's some people on the planet Earth that, that survive and get energy on fat. 
So I think the jury's not in. All I can tell you is what we've learned here since 1956. Go ahead so, and put a comparison study, put uh, the same athletes on a high fat oil based diet, put the same athletes on a high whole complex carbohydrate diets, put the same athletes on a high protein diet. Pio Astrand, the famous uh, Swedish uh, physiologist did this. I have the textbook on my uh, shelf and you will see that uh, without exception, every one of them performed better on a high 500 gram or more complex carbohydrate, low fat, low protein diet, adequate in protein, I might say, not low. I shouldn't even use those words because we get all the protein we need as proven by Walter Kempner, 20 to 40 grams of protein a day. They cleared up their kidneys. They cleared up their diabetes, their heart <clears> disease, <throat> and they lost 147 pounds of fat before after pictures. And they were able to sustain that. I've had people on my program for 20 to 40 years. I've monitored them, including myself. And we do every imaginable test. When a new test comes up, we're looking for cancer markers, omegas, we're checking everything. And if these things, you know, uh, in all respect to Udo, if I see a low uh, omega, I'm looking at it, but I'm looking at the marine algae. Where does the fish get its fats from? From, from the, the algae. I'm looking at where's the best sources of fats, nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, well, flaxseed, walnuts. And I notice they relieve an essential fatty acid. Dr. Press did an experiment, put people on a glucose IV for 30 days. They developed fat, essential fatty acid deficiencies. He then rubbed oil on the skin and it relieved that essential fatty acid deficiency just within days of rubbing it through the skin and absorption. So guys, that's, we that's absorb fat, we stop, need fat stop. and we can get it. Stop there for a minute and repeat that. So you're saying subdermally, it actually increased the omega count, but when you ingested it, it reduced it? What, I, what I'm saying is that uh, when, when you're ingesting separated oils, the big danger is clumping of the blood rouleau. Every doctor who's ever looked at blood under a microscope, and I've checked blood hematology experts, uh, uh, Dr. Dipmai Maharaj, world expert, uh, stem cell expert in Florida, and he admits he never him. looks at, yeah, he never looks at live blood like I do. I've tested all the doctors you know. Uh, Michael Clapper, they, they've worked for me or I've tested them. And I can tell you for a fact, I can repeat this experiment over and over again. So I'm going to say it very simply. I'm not going to defer to say that if you eliminated all oils from the diet, but it was done by Dr. Press, that using oil on the skin is enough because the brain has its needs, the, the nerves, et cetera. But what I'm saying is it was enough to relieve an essential fatty acid deficiency showing up in the skin and various symptoms. What I'm saying is that we have to be judicious about this highly concentrated food we call fat. And when we do eat soap, nut seeds, I believe Dr. Howell wrote a book about enzymes. You may buy into this or not. There's some dispute about enzymes and live food, but I think there's a lot of value in it, right? Live begets live. So I don't think there's much argument there, but I I would say that nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives, you should pour off the anti-enzyme property when you soak them because they may deplete your own body's enzymes and en enzymes uh, beget life. So I do soak them and I'm very careful and I do the daily dozen like uh, uh, Michael Greger talks about. I add my own spins on whole foods. And so I, I'm a very big believer, whatever you can get from whole foods, but then I don't leave it there. I take supplements where I see deficiencies and I intervene on each patient every single time and even even take it to the caution. I take these added supplements, about 30. Jack Lang took 90 supplements every day for every year he was old. And he was a fitness addict and he only had a, an adrenal deficiency and a little interest in alcohol. And I think he just had a little problem when he had a cold or a flu and it put him over the, over the hill. But every one of you know that the immune system is very delicate. The body is strong when treated properly. So let's use oils properly. They are nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, used in amounts that meet our daily needs. And how do we know? We check omega tests. We check for symptoms. We check for brain function and cognition. I've helped people with Alzheimer's stage four, reverse it, not just by putting whole foods in their diet and taking all the animal dairy. We all agree, get rid of animal dairy, except a few of us on the panel, but I put them on bioidentical hormones. I put them on outdoor daylight. I put them on stem cells and I get their brain function back. I've done this with not a lot, but about five patients and we've reversed and brought them back. Okay, Let me ask you, I, what, what so lipid I, profile is best? Can, You're um, doing an extensive lipid profile? Yes. Hey, Udo, Udo is about to say something. Yeah, well, well it's okay. I can, I can wait till last. It's not a problem. Uh, 
So you want to you want to answer the question well, and then April like protein A should be done at least once. You know, once you know that's not a genetic factor, then then you're pretty much home free. But I do look at free fatty acids, not just triglycerides, because sometimes I'll get a low triglyceride and have a huge amount of free fatty acids that I see under the microscope, and then I pick it up uh, with a, a quick side test. And Critic can admit this as well. Also, uh, fasting <laughs> in the morning, you're going to get your highest triglycerides, and that's why uh, Joseph Mercola told me once that he doesn't eat fruit because he's afraid of triglycerides. But if you understood that in a 24 hour period, uh, if you go 12 hours, and you then uh, check the blood uh, in a normal state, like post prandial, I love to check people in the middle of the day, because then I really catch them with what's going on in their bloodstream, not just fasting. And most every study can uh, concurs with what I'm saying, and that is the postprandial better matches cardiovascular risk, diabetic risk. And the only reason we started fasting for tests because people eat like pigs, they eat so badly. There's so much oil and fat in their blood. They had to say, hey, that was just a, a fake test. Don't worry, go home. You ate steak and eggs and meat and, and cake. Just come back after fasting. Okay, good patient. You, you pass, pass the test. That's ridiculous. You should be able to pass your test. And I have benchmarks for where your triglycerides should be after you eat. And I told this to Mercola. He didn't quite follow what I was saying. I agree, avoid industrial fructose, avoid the sugars, but don't throw out the baby with the baby wash. Don't throw out the, you know, the whole fats, keep the whole fats, get rid of the oils. It's so clear in blood and blood chemistry. And yes, I check HDL, LDL, VLDL. I check every imaginable kind of test for lipids. I do uh, the ultra fast CT scans to look at imaging. Now, some people like myself have some old hardened plaques, but we have no soft plaques or completely gone. There's some pig studies show you might reverse hardened old plaques, but it's probably fairly difficult because I used to eat 12 eggs a day. I was the biggest animal eater you can imagine. I had my first stroke when I was 21, like John McDougall. I don't want to have another stroke. I'm not going to go back to eating oils, meat, cheese, eggs, and dairy products. That's insanity. I'm not going to die young because I got to break that record. Okay. Well, I don't know what's going on my on my 19th chromosome, but it's a little bit different from what I'm hearing here. The way I got into oils was because it was confusing. You know, I learned about essential fatty acids, omega-6 and omega-3, that your body can't make, but you have to have, so they have to come in from outside. And omega-3 was established as essential the year after I got interested in nutrition because I got poisoned by pesticides. So I was looking at all of this, and the thing that drove me nuts was the research said omega-6 is essential. That's been known since 1929. And then there'd be a st the next study I would read, say omega-6s give you cancer and kill you. And I was like, huh? <laughs> it's essential for health and it kills you. What? <laughs> and and th it drove me nuts. And so what I did is I looked deeper into why that could, why this contradiction could exist. Something that's essential, killing you. And it, that's when I discovered the, the processing done to oils. Oils, the essential fatty acids, omega-3 especially, the most sensitive of all of our essential nutrients, damaged very easily by light, by oxygen, and by heat, needs the most care of all of our nutrients, and we throw it in a frying pan and, and wreck it with light, oxygen, and heat all at the same time. And so the idea that came to me was, well, we should be, I can't get healthy on damaged oils. I'll get to that in a second. We should make them with health in mind. And then I developed a method for doing that. Now, why is that? Because the industry since 1900, when it began, the major industry, not the olive oil industry, because that's a little older, but the oil industry, in order to get a long shelf life on oils, took the oils out of the food they were in and then treated them with sodium hydroxide, which we know as Drano, that we clean out our sink pipes with, right? When they, when they clog up, we burn through it. Very corrosive base. Then they treated with phosphoric acid, a very corrosive acid that is used for cleaning, degreasing windows. Then they treated it with bleaching clays because the color molecules in oils absorb light and the light then damages the oil because they're sensitive to damage by light. So they have to get rid of those. So they do that with bleaching clays. And then the oil is rancid. It's oxidized and, it, and smells bad. 
And in order to clean that up, they have to deodorize it. I used to call it destinkerize it, right? Because <laughs> it stinks, so you have to treat it with with. Uh, and you, and the way you do that is you heat it to frying temperature in order to get rid of the rancid molecules. You're actually boiling them off the oil. You're boiling the oil to get rid of the rancid molecules. And at the end of it, you have a colorless, odorless, tasteless cooking, uh, what do they call them? Salad cooking and culinary oil. And, all of, and, and it's been heated to frying temperature before it went into the plastic bottle, before it went in the sh on the shelf, before anybody went and bought it. And all, most all of the research on oils is done with those kind of oils. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, the research in lipids, they said, when you treat oil that way, a half to 1% of the molecules are damaged. So a half to 1%. And so I called the Oil Chemist Society. I said, I want to talk to a researcher. They got the guy on the phone. I said, well, when do you know this, does dam this processing does damage to the oil? Why do you do that? And he said, well, one of the reasons we do that is because when we, when we treat the oil that way, we can get rid of the half of the pesticides in the oil. I was like, well, I didn't even know there were pesticides in oils, right? So I'm shocked. And of course, I got poisoned by pesticides. So it was a, a bit of a trigger for me. So I said to him, well, why don't you start with organically grown seeds? Because then you don't have the problem. And there was this long silence at the other end of the phone. And I waited, <laughs> you know, I can talk, but I wait, I, I'm a good waiter too. You may have noticed, right? And then when he got back, he was really ticked. He said, I don't know what your problem is. The oil is 99% good and it's only 1% damaged. And if you got 99% on an exam, you'd be damn happy, wouldn't you? So now I'm backing off and I say, well, maybe I'm overreacting. It's only 1%. So we have a saying, when in, in doubt, do the math. So I did the math. So I said, the question I asked is, if you have a tablespoon of oil that has been treated this way, and it's 1% damaged, how many damaged molecule would you have in that tablespoon of oil? So I want you guys each to give me a number if you would do it. Just guess, you know, because you don't know, right? You don't know. 10 to, so. the, 10 to the 22nd, pretty high. Okay. Anybody else? If you're looking just at damage, why are yeah, you just, addressing the oils thickening the blood? You have not addressed the clumping of the blood. That is the well, biggest well, issue. We, we haven't taken the oil yet. We haven't even taken the oil yet to mess up the blood. I'm, okay. I, I'm talking about the processing. Well, the processing many, is a serious problem. Agreed. Yeah, how many damage? How many damaged molecules? I got. I got one number. I, I would agree. Ten, ten to the six. Uh, over a million. It could be ten to the uh, ten to the seventh, uh, as Joshua mentioned. I okay, said so the end of the twenty second. Oh, the twenty second. Wow, that's that's an infinity number. <laughs> okay, and you said uh, ten. Uh, you said I, I'm uh, saying ten, 10 to the seventh, probably uh, ten which million. Is, which is know. ten million. Okay, Gabriel, Doctor well, Gabriel. I'm just guessing here, right? Yeah, of course we get. Of course we're all guessing. This this is the fun of it. So I'd say at ten to the seventh. Say, okay, and and do you? I have no idea. Oh, uh, that, that's not a number. Sorry, come on, you got to play. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be a purely speculation, so it's of a course. silly thing to speculate. Yeah, of course. It's a silly I, thing I, to speculate. Yeah. Uh, come on, give me a number. Possibly in between 10 to 12 and 7 to 12. <laughs> 10 to 12 and 7 to 12? What? <laughs> in between that. Okay. So I do this with audiences when I talk. And invariably, their estimate of damage is at least a billion times too low, a billion times too low. Now, I've never ever, except today, got a 10 to the 22nd. That's, that's an outrageously high number. <laughs> that's high. But 10 to the 7th, 10 million, you said 10 million, right? So 10 million, mm -hmm. you have to go to 10 billion, 10 trillion, 10 quadrillion, 10 quintillion, times six. That's how much too low your estimate was. 
And you guys are smart guys, right? And, and the number is 60 quintillion damaged molecules in a tablespoon of oil that is 1% damaged. And that's enough to get you a, a million, more than a million damaged molecules for every one of your body's 60 trillion cells. But, but Udo, if you eat nuts, seeds, avocados, they're less damaged than oil. I buy your oil and yeah. I rub it on my skin. Yeah, yeah. But, right? And then you smell like paint all day. <laughs> At night, I, I wash off in the morning. My girlfriend yeah, okay. doesn't matter. She oh, you doesn't do, are you? Okay, so yeah, then yeah. your sheets, then your sheets to crunch are crunchy in the morning. No, I, I put on the long uh, jogging trunks that I wash, um, you know, periodically. So I, I dealt with that issue. <laughs> oh, was okay. Yes. Okay. So, Udo, are, are you yeah. saying I'm a little bit too high at 10 to the 22nd? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you you you're the only person who's ever been too high. They're always at least a billion times too low. And of course, our two other experts here, U Udo, uh, the, the one who wasn't Udo, chicken. Excuse me, but, Udo. Udo, mm -hmm. please let make the point. I want to move on with other questions. So make the point yeah. that you're trying to make. Okay, so, so the point was the issue I, and all of the research, almost all of the research is done on oils that have that much damage done to them. And they, nobody makes a distinction between what of the problems that these oil, oils cause comes from processing and what is damage caused by the oil itself. And so what we did, we decided to make oils with health in mind. We created a very tight system so that no light, no oxygen and low temperature gets to the oil, you know, and it's in glass, not in plastic, because plastic leaches into oils. And we focus on not saturated fats, which make your blood sticky, but on the essential fatty acids, which have negative charges and actually disperse instead of clogging. And, and then we, and then- That's in your uh, conversation that when you heat an oil, and that's what you're suggesting, that the processed oil, and when an oil becomes rancid, you have the same exact molecule problem. So right. uh, yeah. you well, can take, you get you free, can you take get your free. oil, leave it out in the sun, and, and in two weeks, it's going to be giving the same kind of peroxide problem. Of that course, you have of course process. because they're very sensitive. We're making very sensitive oil. They need a lot of protection. We give them the protection. It's a pain in the ass to work with them, but that's, that's what we do. And when using those oils, we've used them with athletes. We've done two, a couple of studies with athletes. If they took, and we're taking pretty high quantities, a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day. So for most people, it would be two, three, four tablespoons mixed in food spread out over the course of the day. And within 30 days, the athletes that we have in our study, if they did their sport to exhaustion, had 40 to 60% increase in stamina. Is that a published study that you did? No, we didn't publish it because we're, we were not affiliated with the university. We had one done in Denmark and the other one was a multinational study. And, uh, That's interesting. And, and, uh, and then some of our athletes found it so amazing that they actually doubled the intake to 50% of their calories and they rant and raved about how fast they recovered, <clears throat> how quickly they healed, how much less pain they had in their joints, how, how much faster they built, built up their, their, their muscles in their exercise. Uh, no, no, let me ask a question and, to the, yeah. let me ask a question to the panel. You made a great point. Yeah. Don't <laughs> you think an athlete who's a competitive athlete uh, could burn off oil much differently than you and I who sit behind a desk often. What do all of you think about that? Completely. Yeah, of course. Someone yeah. like Rich Roll who runs ultra marathons or me, I do nonstop weightlifting. Yeah. We definitely burn more fat. I've proven that under the microscope. <laughs> I've seen the triglycerides, the free fatty acids. 90% of people listening to this show are couch potatoes. Even if they're yeah. plant-based, I notice they don't get into exercise. Even my mom makes the excuse. I says, oh, son, I know the diet works so well. And, you know, uh, I'm going to skip exercise. I said, no, so, mom, we're going to go for a walk in the morning. I just published, by the way, my free fatty acids. Uh, that is my omegas, EPA. DPA, literally that I got April 10th, 2022. I'm not afraid to publish my results on everything I'm doing. So you can see yeah. how I'm going to break the world record for healthy aging. The only thing is slightly low is my omega uh, three. Everything else is perfect. And so what I'm doing is so, leaning into a little bit more of the omega three and rubbing so, that into my skin so, and taking that in my whole food. 
Okay, Gabriel, so, what do you so think me, about that athleticism? Guys, and, I don't. I don't want to go in a lot of directions. Just I want to focus. I want to move to the next question. Udo, okay. please. You have anything final to say in yeah. ten seconds on this? Yeah. The other thing that is help is helpful is that the omega threes are five times more sensitive than the omega sixes, and if and if you get enough of them, first of all, they increase your metabolic rate, they increase thermogenesis, they give you more energy. If your mother got more, she might actually exercise because she has energy to do that. <laughs> they also improve brain function. And we used as optimum to take enough oil to make your skin soft and velvety because omega-3 and 6 together form a barrier in the skin against the loss of moisture. When you only get one or you don't get enough, your skin goes dry because your inner inner organs get priority on them. So we measure optimum by skin feel. And if your skin is dry, you will also end up with low energy level. And if when you optimize your oil intake, you not only get the nice skin, but you also you also get the energy. This is what we keep getting the feedback on consistently. And I've been at it since 1981. So that's like 40 well, years. That's the year we discovered omega-3. Yeah, uh, 1980. Well, I start. I got poisoned in 1980. I, I happened to be at, there at the right time, which is why I got into omega threes. So I didn't invent the omega threes, but I got there at the perfect time. Okay, and thank then, you, thank yeah. you. Let me move on to the next question. So, um, regarding the diet itself, we are all throwing around the term whole food, plant based. Brian and Dr. Cousins, you have specifically said that an ideal diet is not just cooked beans, cooked whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. What you've said is the ideal diet is mostly a raw diet, which means sprouted seeds, um, vegetables, um, and sprouted nuts and seeds. But mostly you're saying sprouts and vegetables is the core of your diet. And you've demonstrated fantastic health results for everything. But the one issue with it is I've tried it and I don't get filled up the way I do with cooked beans. And I've asked you about it and you've told me I'm a fast oxidizer. Gabriel, you've said it's a spiritual thing, emptiness. It could be. And I'm saying that I've given it a really fair chance for many years, 16 different sprouts, giant bowl, ate it for 45 minutes for lunch, 45 minutes for dinner. And no matter what I do, it's not the same as a big bowl of cooked lentils with onions. And mm. I, you know, and I'm just, I'm saying, I love you guys and I appreciate your information. And I know that you're amazing. And I, I do believe it works great, but it's a practical matter. I know almost no one that is saying they can live on greens and sprouts, which means anyone who's a raw foodist is either eating a lot of fruit, which you're not, you haven't recommended, or they're loading up on nut seeds, olives and avocados. And so I guess I'm saying, unless I'm going to eat macadamia nuts and avocados in big quantities and olives every single day, I feel like I need to eat cooked beans. And I don't think I'm alone because when we do webinars and seminars, we can barely find anyone who really can stick to a sprouted diet. So I'm wondering, do we really need to be raw? Because it seems like you have to be a high fat eater to be raw, where it seems so much easier to just eat cooked beans at dinner. And you could all comment on this on yeah. the raw versus cooked. You can so do some raw of us don't eat, and cook. Some yam. of us don't eat dinner. So let's start with when you're doing live food, when you cook food, you lose 50% of the protein, 60 to 70% of the vitamins and minerals, and up to 96% of the phytonutrients. So as I've evolved, and I'm talking the 2000 push up type thing. I don't eat dinner <laughs> and I hardly have breakfast, I have one meal a day. How does that happen? Worse, I don't take, I don't take digestive enzymes anymore. How does that happen? So there is a regeneration that goes on. The less you eat, the longer you live. And we can look at that in terms of the upgrading of your um, gene expression, okay? And that's, I think, the important thing. And I want to add to something to it uh, is that part of my diet is I meditate two hours a day. And we know 
in the research that was that's been done is if you're meditating for five years, your general physiology is 15 years younger. So we got to kind of look a little bit broader into that. So I eat one meal a day. I don't eat dinner. Okay. I mean, I have liquids and I have fluids, but I'm not talking about solids. So the less you eat, the longer you live. So there's a the whole other piece there that's kind of missing in the discussion. You still have the right ratio according to your chromosome 19. Different issue. So I, I just want to throw that in into the bigger picture. I, I don't even think about be, beans. I mean, I understand that's okay because where you're at. But when you get clear, your desires for all these things go away too. And you're just, you're, and it's like you have energy all day long. Why would you want to eat beans? Now, I know you're making a point, and I'm, I'm making an opposite point, is your physiology is still requiring something like that. We have to go with where our physiology is or we, where we are. So that's the point I'm trying to make there. So let's, let me uh, chime in here a little bit. Uh, you know, it's got to be individually looked at. So I've, I've worked with so many people that have been able to eat this way. I don't know if people call into the real truth about health and they're not those people, but I also see a lot of people struggle with this. And you, know, you and I have had this conversation over the 20 years we've known each other. There is an emotional component. Go back to what Gabriel pointed out Meditation actually puts you into a deep sense of relaxation, and there's a calm, and cortisol levels go down. And the fact it of the matter is, it also grows your brain. It also actually grows your brain. Brain it does grow your brain. Yeah, you don't lose. Your... As a matter of fact, with uh, solid meditators, when they looked at the Tibetan monks as an example, they don't lose a percent every ten years. As a matter of fact, they gained. They have larger brains than anyone else. <laughs> and they don't say much. It's unfortunate. They'd be pretty smart, I think. <laughs> but the reality is that there is an emotional component to this. And I had that emotional component. When I first ate this way, uh, what I served the entire campus with 200 people, I used to eat myself in a day. And just like Gabriel, but this isn't fair to talk to a 50-year-old or certainly a 20-year-old or an athlete, I've only eaten one meal a day for the last 15 to 20 years. But I drink massive amounts of juices with high caloric intake made of sprouts, which have the essential fatty acids in it. You could live on those juices. You'd be awfully skinny. But, you know, so what are we eating and what are we not eating? Are we taking, I'm drinking a quart to a quart and a half of green juice a day because it's available here for the average person. And economically, they may not be able to do that. But that alone gives you a caloric intake for energy. And then the nutrient load. Uh, Ditto what you said. I mean, proteins are pretty much destroyed when you cook a food and vitamins are, are virtually gone. And if you look at the most important reason the Living Food Program has had the most success in reversing all catastrophic diseases, and those of us that live this way, we don't age, is the phytochemicals. And one of the guys who's on our, our faculty for our online program, Dr. David Williams, who's been here, uh, basically tells us you cook any food above 115, they're gone. And then you look at uh, phenols. I mean, the, the list goes on. And let's go back to the, the oil thing. We've known since I was a one-year-old boy, science, and nobody's successfully reversed this, that when you heat anything with an oil in it, it becomes carcinogenic, period. This is not a, an, an opinion. This is in the book. You know, so lettuce has oil in it. Spinach has oil in it. There's nothing that doesn't have oil, no less nuts. And I used to eat nothing but roasted nuts. When I started to eat raw nuts, by the way, they didn't taste good to me because they didn't have salt and they didn't have God knows what, peanut oil on them or whatever. So this takes a transition. <laughs> and when one is, is having happy life with their work, with their partners, with their family, and they feel secure, and you, I, I strongly advise, the current magazine that's coming out now is on mindfulness that you take that into account. And I used to think I had no problems because I had great parents, all of the things I just mentioned I have. But by the way, when I was hypnotized, I was shocked at the issues I had. 
And after they released those things, I felt like a different person. I went from a guy carrying rocks in my pants to a guy that was flying just from one session where I went into hypnosis and had issues that are silly issues to a grown adult, but seemingly they were stopping me from flourishing. So I think there's so many things we have to take into account. And I, I agree with you, Stephen, very practically, most people have a hard time to adapt the lightness of life, that they really struggle and they think struggle is part of it. And they think, you know, suffering is part of it and food is everything. Uh, but eventually when you have a real life and a big life and a happy life, food becomes a fuel. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you can't, the, the key is you can't eat your way to God. And you have to look at is longevity the goal of life or is God the goal of life? Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think those are yeah. really, really yeah. important differences so, between the transhumanism, which is talking about how long you live, and the your soul merging with God as the primary goal in life. They're, they're really important, yeah. gigantic differences in what life is about. I think you're yeah, alluding I, to some of that. Thank if you. I, if I could, if I can uh, say something about it. I do not do well on on uh, grains. I have never done well on grains. I'm always a little overweight. I think carbs lead to a little bit of water retention. They have never really worked for me. So I eat seeds and nuts, but I have also found out and I tested it because people said, well, you should eat like ma nature makes it. Perfect health comes from nature. And I, I had a doubt about it. I said, well, you know, ma nature's mandate is not necessarily optimum health. You should be ha healthy enough to be born, to be able to grow up, to have children, to be around till the children don't need you anymore. And, and then, that, then nature doesn't need you anymore either. And so I actually did a test. I tried to eat, get all my oil from Whole Foods. I used flax, sunflower, and sesame seeds. Flax for omega-3s, sunflower and sesame for omega-6s. The ratio was twice as much omega-3 as omega-6. That's the ratio we found the most effective in terms of energy and healing and all of, all of the things we talk about. And even in summer in California, when it was warm, when I need less oil than in winter, because you burn oil in winter for, to create heat, except if you're in Florida, of course, <laughs> there's no winter there, right? So even in summer, when I need less oil, I could not keep my skin soft and velvety. My skin got dry. And, uh, and, and so I say, okay, eat all the, I'll get all the fat you need from seeds if you want. If you can get your, your skin to feel oiled from within, good. But I can't do it that way. It doesn't... My new book, Stephen, I'm going to give you a copy. It comes out in about two weeks, is Discovering You and You. And this, this entire book is on this issue. I wrote the book for this answer, by the way. Hey, guys, it's... I've been I've been practicing timeline therapy, which releases negative emotions and limiting beliefs. I learned from Dr. Richard Bandler, Dr. Tad James. I work with Tony Robbins. And I know that the emotional component is the biggest reason that holds people back from eating a whole foods diet. They make all these excuses. I don't have time to eat properly. I can't eat at restaurants. I don't have time to exercise. Well, bullshit. I'm sorry for the word. But the truth is your mind has been programmed since you were seven years old to believe in advertising that we've all been inundated and programmed to believe Coca-Cola is actually good for you. This is an insane culture. And if we it's believe that the hospitals, right? The hospitals, Brian, they're not serving what you serve. They're serving the same stuff they serve at the Holiday Inn because the, they're worried the patients will rate them badly because they're worried they won't like the food. I went into Lee Shackley's home and the, the wife stage four uh, Alzheimer's. And I said, we're going to change her diet. And the RD argued with me. She says, no, we're not. She won't eat it. She eats meatballs and sausage and, and uh, lasagna. And I said, no, we're going to make her the food. She can't, she's drooling. She doesn't know what she's eating. So I gave her the cookbook like I did Tony Robbins. They prepared all the food. And sure enough, she ate the food. She started getting better. We put her on outdoors for vitamin D. We put her on, on hormones, IV injections, stem cells. We, we, the doctor was fired because Lee Shackley said, Nick, if he won't follow what you say, fire him and bring in your own doctor. I did. Within about 
two months, she went from stage four Alzheimer's to Newport Beach Fashion Island in her limo, walked up to each storekeeper and greeted them by name and recalled every conversation. This is doable, folks. Most of these people are drug-induced Alzheimer's, dementia. They are, I have clients coming to me that are very famous and they're 70, 80 years old. They're on so many drugs. It's insane. Opiates is the number one cause of death. Oxycon of people. And uh, what is that other one that's out? Uh, uh, fentanyl. Eight, yeah, fentanyl. Age 18 to 45. This is a horrible culture that allows doctors to prescribe something that gets people addicted. And it's not the doctor's fault. It's their training. Let's go back and train our doctors, train our hospitals. I went into Midwood Community Hospital, Stanton Community Hospital. I put them all on a plant-based diet. I had them walking up and down the halls back in 1978 when it wasn't even fashionable. I was working with Pritikin and the nurses were freaking out. Why are you walking these heart patients? You're going to get them worse. Well, now we know exercise helps heart patients. We got them better. We got them helped in the ward because our ward was doing it all right. Diet, exercise, stress management. And every one of my clients, I put them through NLP, timeline therapy, letting go all these fake emotions, put them on sleep tapes where they listen for nine hours all night on a blackened screen and they sleep deep because sleep is one of the keys to longevity and emotional well-being and hormone replacement. God forbid you wake up in the morning without a morning erection because you didn't sleep properly. So guys, let's do this. Let's train the world. You're doing an incredible job, job the real truth about health. And I'm the first plant-based doctor to really come out outspoken and saying many of the plant-based doctors have depressed hormones, not because of their diet. And you don't go and eat meat just to get estrogen, which is estrogen dominance is a hidden factor. 10 to the six, estrogen comes from most meat, cheese, eggs, dairy product. It doesn't come from plastics so much. So you've got to know that the animal-based diet is tainted because they have menstrual cycles. Even if you don't hormone induce these animals, you're getting toxicity, according to my new book, Disease Hacking. And it's been endorsed by John McDougall, by Bob Goldman, by some of the top experts in the world. I hope you guys will read it too before pre-press. And if you like the book, please mention you I like it, it you know love and it. i i am excited for you guys because the real truth about health should open the forum that you can't just do it on diet you got to exercise you got to sleep but you got to optimize your hormones when you reach my age i'm 67 <laughs> i should be in a fucking grave 65 percent, <laughs> 65 years or older 95 percent of people are dead i'm i'm breaking world records at my age i'm making love to my girlfriend every morning and night i'm living the life that a rock star does without the drugs and chemicals and alcohol i've treated alcoholics because because they have cortisol deficiency. A comment that was made wrong. Cortisol doesn't go up and it's not bad. Cortisol is the number one key hormone that if it elevates, it protects you and you don't have to depend on adrenaline. Cortisol is a life-giving hormone. And I, I reference the world uh, expert, Dr. Terry Hertog, who wrote the Atlas of Endocrinology. I've interviewed him several times. And he agrees to IGF is not the bad guy like plant doctors are saying. IGF should be in a good range. These little dwarfs that uh, Walter Longo talked about that are so shiny and health, they have miserable lives. When you give them uh, IGF and growth hormone, they thrive. So you've got to understand that when you mix the science, the real science about hormones, peptides, supplements, stem cells, and the diet, now you've got a real solution for patients. Let and me Nick, say is, Nick is, is we, just right. Yeah. Let me say it, something before we forget. Uh, I was on two national tours with Nathan Pritikin, and this man was crucified because he wasn't a medical doctor. Matter of fact, he didn't even have a, a college degree. He was just a genius. And I would sit next to him. The first two or three interviews we did, I tried to say something. And I realized this guy was a walking uh, encyclopedia. He had a photographic memory. He would actually tell us what he read at 10 years old, what the name of the book was, what chapter and what the sentence said. And so let's give Nathan Pritikin a hand because a lot of us, by the way, got a lot from him. Yes. I spent every day for three years working along his side, listening to every question and answer. I too have a photographic memory. I love the man. He was amazing. And unfortunately it was commented in the chat and I answered it that, you know, he, he, he died because of his diet. That's not true. He had a thyroid condition induced from uh, that caused hairy cell leukemia from a radiation treatment because they were trying to knock out his thyroid because he had a hyperthyroid condition and his yeah. eyes were bulging. He had thyroid problems. He lived another 20 years because of his diet. And then yeah, a doctor got a hold of him and did interferon therapy to try and knock it out once and for all they claimed to get rid of the leukemia and they knocked out his kidney function one night he took his life because he knew he i don't care if that smoke. guy died at 60 what he did and what he left to the world god bless him and thank god for him that's what i can say
<laughs> I, I published his entire library with his actual notes. If you go to from the doctors.com forward slash Pritik, and I put this in the chat, please visit Say it. Say that again slower. From the doctors.com forward slash Pritik, and I'll type it in the notes. Thank you. Thank his you. entire uh, transcripts, everything he did, and I included 5,000 slides that I converted from 35 millimeter slides to Google slides, and I'm going to recreate every talk with John McDougall and any other practitioner would like to join me to do it and get the word out because the real truth about health is about bringing the truth to people. And Pritikin was a genius. He had 14 patents, engineering and, uh, and in chemical engineering. He, he was absolute a genius. And I, 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 I missed the day that I lost him. He was like a father to me. And when my wife died of hyperthyroidism, I realized uh, 29 years ago that there was a void. I knew plant-based work, but I didn't understand hormones. So then I traced down the best hormone doctors in the world to, to master that because I didn't want to see anyone suffer a, a tragedy in their life. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hellman, why don't you go ahead and speak? Go ahead. Yeah. So, so Nick, I, I agree with you. I want to join you on that. And then also say one of the key points here is we need to get people off of processed foods. That's number one. Number two, we need to decrease toxin levels for patients because, because of the high levels of toxins, they're, they're, they're endocrine disruptors, which are, you know, ruining the, the normal adrenal um, estrogen, testosterone systems. So it's a complicated system, and and the processed foods are are highly addictive, and and many people can't do this by themselves. And it's it's great to be here. Yeah, and hey. Joshua, you said it well, and I'm going to answer to Brian and ask him a question. When no, I hold on, Nick, Nick, use, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move I put on. It in I'm my Vitamix, so I have fiber also because I'm worried about getting a fiber on all juicing. Okay. I, I know there's a lot of passion and a lot of great things to say, but let me focus on a few things. Um, specifically, um, again, we have 75 speakers at the conference. There is only one person at the entire conference, and that's Brian Clement, that is standing up, looking people in the eyes and saying, oh, by the way, I'm not recommending you eat fruit. There's 74 people. Uh, Gabriel, I guess, might be in Brian's side. I'm not sure he'll answer. But literally, 73 of the 75 people are saying, of course, you should have fruit. It's it's an ideal fruit, fruit and vegetables. And I've asked Brian a hundred times, and he continues to say that he's not recommending fruit. Now, um, and why? And I just would like to clarify why um, no one else. Well, you know, what research are you looking at, Brian and Gabriel? I know you've looked into this. Why is no one else saying this? Where do we stand with fruit? For well, everyone, like back, everyone. Well, <clears throat> well I go back. I, and talk about why that occurred. So when I joined the team in 1975 in Boston, we were almost a fruit place. You know, you came here, it was a fruit orgy. And I was really happy because I was a sugar addict and just uh, replaced my white sugar and my honey and my maple syrup and everything else I would be drinking by the gallon and eating by the gallon uh, with mangoes and the juices of watermelon and the list goes on. Now, that was really fun until 1980 when I came back from three and a half years in Europe where the Hippocrates sent me and I directed centers, open centers, et cetera. And uh, now they made me the director. So no longer was it kumbaya, it was my ass was on the line and people's lives were in my hands. And 80 to 90% of who came through Hippocrates at that point were dying of a catastrophic disease. So I couldn't be uh, flippant in any way. And so, in pretty short order, within the first year and a half, I started to see visible tumors. Uh, breast cancers were common, but even uh, in protruding from the liver and other things. When people would take large amounts of the fruit and carrot juice and beet juice that we gave them, they would actually enlarge. They would inflame. And this was scary to me because the book said at that point, and seemingly still says today, fruit and vegetables. If there's any research, it's always on fruit and vegetables. And let me preface this whole thing by saying, I think the original diet of man was in great part fruit. I don't think so. That's what modern anthropologists tell us. So now I'm in this dilemma. I'm the director. I can't even get people to eat fruit. <laughs> they wanted to eat candy bars. And I'm, I'm now on this rampage and it's sneak. I snuck into the Harvard Medical Library where Josh went, NYU, uh, UCLA, my buddy got me into, and there's nothing in the literature. And this goes on for three years. And of course, I continue to eat fruit because I was addicted to the sugar and happened to be on a plane 
on the way to Los Angeles to lecture. And the guy next to me, a typical American, uh, had to ask me what I did. As you know, we Americans are shallow and young, so we evaluate your status by asking what you do for a living. So I mumbled, I direct an alternative center in Boston, and he got bright eye and bushy tail, and he said, this is Hippoc my aunt went to Hipp Hippocrates, her breast cancer went away, and I said, oh God, I should have shut up. And I said, to be polite, what do you do? He said, I'm an agricultural scientist, my expertise is fruit. God sent him to me. <laughs> So the, I, I didn't want the, the pilot to land in LAX. So he was very polite, and nice, and he talked to me maybe six hours over the next few months. And he taught me some things about fruit cultivation that you couldn't, couldn't find anywhere. You, you still don't find in the literature. He said the Chinese started to hybrid fruit for higher sugar contents thousands of years ago. And now we have it down to an art. So the fruit today doesn't even vaguely resemble the original fruit. Now. You say there's no science on it when you say there's nobody at the real truth about health. I'll correct you, Stephen. So one of my colleagues, a guy I trust the most in cancer, since I deal a lot with cancer and somewhat of an expertise on that, is a guy called who? Tell me who's, who I'm going to uh, talk Thomas about. Thomas Seifert. Thomas Seifert. So we brought Thomas here and a lot of other scientists. Whenever I'm interested in scientists, like the, the people who brought the modern ketogenic diet, I brought here. I don't say they're bad people. They weren't bad. They were lovely people, by the way. And we all had a nice time together. We did a three-day major conference. Guy who's done more brain surgery than any doctor in the country. And these are all open-minded, wonderful human beings, women and men. And he sits here and says, you're all geniuses. You haven't been giving fruit to people for 40 years. How did you do that? And I said, dumb luck. I said, I knew nothing from nothing. I saw tumors come up. I saw tumors go away. And he said, well, here's why. And he sat right here on the campus with me, spent three hours and a half, three hours and 32 minutes to be exact. And he showed me on, a, on paper, this is why the cancers grow, because fruit sugar metabolizes like fat. No other sugar does it. It may make you fat. It may create, as you said, triglycerides and cholesterols, et cetera. But the only one that breaks down and, and digests like fat is fruit. And then he looked and accessed the Warburg work from literally 97 years ago now. And he showed me where Warburg was showing this, not with fruit, but sugar metabolism. That goes back to a, a guy in France, by the way, Millard who was talking about this 100 years ago. And Millard was talking about the pathways of energy and how proteins and sugar bond together. I mean, Christ, he was ahead of his time for now, no less than Millard. And this was amazing to me. Now, the punchline is we took fruit out of the diet for cancer. And in short order, we took fruit out of the diet for viral diseases, bacterial disease. And clinically, I watched the difference. So this is not my opinion. I watched what happened. The damn cancer started to go away. The viruses dramatically dropped, not because I think so, because we saw it on the test. Western blots, cancer tumors, and people went into remission eventually, not only from getting rid of fruit, by living a healthy diet, doing the psychotherapy, doing the energy medicine, taking the supplementation. So I won't back down from this. Maybe other people haven't dealt with as many sick people as I have since I was a 20-year-old boy in 1970. All Thank I can you. tell you, fruit is sugar. It's sugar. Anyone, Dr. Steer <laughs> was the guy at Harvard, by the way, who was on the sugar industry's payroll and the dairy industry's payroll. They used to pit me against him to argue in NBC, CBS, and Boston. The reality is he was a guy that came up with monounsaturates, sat, confused everyone. And all sugars, and sugar is good for you. You actually, I hear people who are holistic doctors today tell me, supposed to be educated, you need to eat sugar, processed sugar for energy. No, you don't. What we know for sure, a 200 pound muscular man could eat two green salads a day that are moderate size, get all the sugar they need because there's sugar everywhere. So I'm not saying you don't need sugar. Your cells need sugar. Your cells need essential fats and your cells need nutrients. But the amount of sugars we have are the problem. And fruit has been high bred to have shocking amounts of, of sugar. Nobody in their right mind doesn't know that. I Thank appreciate you. your pra your passion, Brian. It's good. I, I can't help it. <laughs> I'm a little less passionate about it. I just noticed because we did a lot of fasting retreats, it completely disorganizes people's blood sugars. So we stopped doing any fruit during uh, fasting. But I also note that 
uh, cancer loves fructose 10 times more than it loves cancer cells, than even glucose. I also know that brain inflammation, the glia cells of the brain, uh, get much more inflamed with fructose. I also know in terms of diabetes, fructose disorganizes the different hormone that goes on in, in terms of not just insulin, okay? Leptin, insulin imbalances. So fructose has a very imbalancing effect, even though initially it doesn't raise your blood sugar directly like glucose does, but it imbalances the, the leptin insulin <clears throat> in a way that actually enhances getting diabetes, enhances uh, levels of Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So there are a lot of problems with fructose. And the people, the average person, I think in the US has about 81 grams of fructose a day. 10, 15 grams you can get by with, which is obviously very little. But the main point is that there's some very direct physiological things that fruit does, does which I just kind of outlined. So that's why I don't recommend fruit in the, in, for the, you know, ultimately the same reason because it can undermine your health. The doesn't mean it, you couldn't have out one piece of fruit, but the, the way people eat fruit, I think, is, is uh, I think, creates a lot of inflammation in the body and is, is associated with a lot of degenerative decline. The, 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 let, let me, let me also way, say to you that when people brought, are healthy, we tell them by, by weight, they can eat up to 15% of their diet as ripe. Or I can't fruit. see so it. Get me into the ripe mm -hmm. stuff. There's no such thing as ripe fruit. Uh, the the way I came to this the, the between vegetables and fruit is if I eat too much fruit I I don't it doesn't work I, I I don't feel good then I started thinking about it is if you look at nature and you look at how much greenery is there and how much fruit is there in nature even in the tropics when you have fruit all year round it's like ten times more greens than fruit in nature <laughs> right a lot more than that that should tell you something and up here where I live. You know, it's like you get fruit for like maybe three, four months a year, and then you got no fruit at all, but you still got lots of greens. So I, I came to the conclusion we ought to be eating about 10 times more vegetable than fruit. And when you do that, then the fruit's not a problem. Yeah, it makes sense. And the key is you want to eat organic. If you're eating fruit, eat organic fruit and uh, whole fruit. You don't want to eat processed fruit. Yeah. So, yep. Organic. And guys, it, it really depends on sequencing. If someone's fat and overweight, which most Americans are, then we start with the green and yellow vegetables. Then we sequence over to fruit. And I say that because fruit is still a medium low calorie. It, it has polyphenols. It stabilizes blood sugar. Uh, the David Jenkins, who I was showing you, who created the, the concept of the glycemic index, stated that whole fruit balances out blood sugar. When he was asked, how much fruit can you eat each day? You know what the answer was? Anyone know the answer? As much as you want. As much as you want. 20 pieces of fruit or more was okay. But the, the point is that- Doesn't you have work for me. You have, for you- you have, Everyone's different. You, you, you eat a lot of oil and the oil desensitizes your insulin. So you couldn't handle fruit like no, I- Actually, omega-3s make you more insulin sensitive. Saturated fats make you insulin resistant. Omega-3s make you more insulin sensitive. Saturated yeah. fats actually block the insulin signaling inside the cells. Saturated fat from fish and meat actually kill the beta cells of the pancreas. One way to lower blood pressure is to eat more fruit. If you eat 10 pieces of fruit a day along with vegetables, your blood pressure, which I know because I used to have high blood pressure as a high school student and on to college and had my first stroke, I include as much fruit as possible throughout the day because it's easy to eat. It's, it's convenient. I don't gorge myself with fruit. I do what's called intuitive eating. So I eat according to hunger. I don't believe that you have to fast as much as you guys talk about. And Brian, when you said fast, you're juice fasting. You're consuming juice. So I take a Vitamix, get the whole yams, the whole beets, and then I'll do a base of cold press uh, 
carrot or beet. And so it really is a highly dense without added water. I want that density because I got to get the fiber. I got to get the vitamins and minerals and nutrients and not overdo my calories. So I'm always in that fine line looking good on camera, you know, with ripped abs if I want, or which is not in a normal state. You got to take diuretics and be a bodybuilder and do things to get ripped abs. Guys die on stage with that stuff. So the reality is we walk around with a healthy percent body fat, uh, percent nutrient, and we got to get our protein down and fruits low on protein. That's why Walter Kempner advocated it for even diabetics and kidney patients. So I, I know that Dr. Tony Jimenez openly states in my conversation with him at Hope for Cancer, he uses fruit in his program. His doctors are confused. Everyone's confused because basically people are telling you fruit is like sugar. And when the reality is it breaks down to two calories per minute, it's not like industrialized sugar fructose that uh, Mercola is so afraid of. Basically, when you get the, the keto people on back onto a plant-based whole food, which includes fruit because it's convenient. If you only get uh, vegetables and celery and, and, and carrots, you're, you're starved. My God, you can't get enough calories, especially if you're an athlete. So I, I think you've got to have a good balance. Include the cooked beans, include the, the brown rice, include, you know, the foods that are going to sustain you. But, you know, sarcopenia is a legitimate problem as you age. I see too many plant-based doctors that look really skinny. And I see a lot of keto people that look really fat, like uh, Atkins did over the years and just kept eating what he advocated. So you really have to lean into, you know, the reality of science. And I would challenge you and, and take a microscope, sit it next to you, do every lab test you want, and then check the cancer markers and see uh, whether the tumors grow or not. I, I've had a passion about cancer. I really respect your work and I hear what you're saying and it concerns everyone at the same time. Let's, let's figure out. I mean, some people say there's low sugar fruit. Yes obviously certain berries and things, but we include all kinds of fruit so long as you're within the caloric need and you're not exceeding your caloric needs, right? Because carbohydrates have a protein sparing effect. They prevent you from burning protein. That's why you don't have to increase your protein in the diet. You get all you need if you get the right ratio of calories to energy needs to repair needs. Right. It's complicated. There's certain stage four cancers that don't want sugar. They want fat and oil to, uh, to uh, spread. So it's not, you can't, you can't generalize to everyone. <clears throat> okay. so for 25 years, we used a microscope on campus. So when we made this transition, uh, my wife was training physicians from all over the world on microscopes. And so we were not only doing the blood test, blood profiles and offering, you know, more sophisticated testing. And you were running lipids at the same time, right? Not oh, just yeah. fast, lipids and, and also and watching Randall during so, the middle of the day. Know, so we actually saw right up front as you do dark field. And I, I don't know, we should be saying this in the open, but the federal government came in and shut us down. We use phase contrast, but we have to do it with the lipid uh, testing because the National Cholesterol Control Act allows us to check lipids and then just show it on the screen as an education material, because otherwise- I need, to, to, I need to talk to you. I can help <laughs> you with that. I can help you with that. I get every doctor in the right compliance, and that's what we have to do to, to do good science. Good. Okay. Let me wrap up with a few more questions. Just answer these fast so I could get to some other questions. So I've- would like for each of you to answer these four things. One, what about salt? Are we trying to avoid salt or are we trying to include salt? Two, um, are we trying to do anything special with iodine? I know Dr. Cousins has spoken a lot about this. Number three, um, what supplements do you recommend? And number four, just for Dr. Delgado, uh, what do we do to be able to make love to our wives and girlfriends twice a day, seven days a week? <laughs> <laughs> the longest lived people in the world do have an early interest in making love. They continue to make love throughout most of their life. And usually if they are plant-based, they're likely going to avoid cholesterol clogged arteries. If you look in China, they have one of the highest rates of ED, interesting, but it's the Chinese wealthy that eat a lot of, of animal product. The, the monks and the Buddhists and so forth that are are plant-based, they yeah. don't have clogged arteries. So your first order of business is get off the animal food, get on a whole plant-based with enough calories. If you don't have enough calories, your first interest in sex goes away when you're hungry. You can't be fasting below your caloric needs. So then you have to optimize, uh, when you mentioned salt, aldosterone, you've got to measure the hormone aldosterone, which holds fluids into the body. And those people like myself who have low aldosterone, I have low vasopressin, and it's kind of a genetic thing. My father has, grandfather has 
had the same look too. So I need a little more salt. I'm a competitive athlete and I salt to taste. I don't salt the water before it's cooking. <laughs> I, I add salt after it's cooked the way McDougal ties, sprinkle a little bit on it. Iodine. Yeah. We, we used to have iodine in the salt. Now you have to use, I use milligram doses of iodine because I'm worried about Fukushima and the horrible pollution pouring into our oceans that everyone's pretending isn't happening. Why do you think uh, uh, up in Russia, they had uh, Chernobyl and a million people die from cancer. There's a higher rate of cancer now, right? Because of these horrible toxins. So iodine and the trace minerals, selenium, and all these things are somewhat protective in the thyroid gland. So I use a lot of different supplements to protect myself. And to also, I use a product when called I, Afore, I use herbs that release, uh, that attach to sex hormone binding globulin because plant-based people have higher testosterone, but they have lower circulating free testosterone. So you've got to liberate it. And so I create uh, supplements that it's called Dr. Delgado's testosterone booster. Sorry about the plug, but I put together 20 different uh, ingredients with zinc, boron, uh, um, the tribulus terrestris, all the right maca, all the right things in there. And so I take those by the handful because that's one of the ways I keep up with these young studs. Otherwise I'd lose my girlfriends to them. So uh, the truth is health and longevity also depends on your testosterone. You have to have a good circulating level. And as you age, just like thyroid might decline, I optimize my thyroid. I optimize my DHEA, but you should not take DHEA orally so much so as it's probably taken better transdermally because when it absorbs it stays as dha when you take dha as a man <laughs> orally anything above 10 milligrams turns into estrogen so we're an estrogen dominant society i use a lot of dim indole 3 carbonyl dr edwin lee the world class endocrinologist in florida he states that he uses dim like he pours like water i used it because i discovered a solution to uh, acne and uh I, I co-wrote this book with board-certified dermatologist, uh, Dr. Sonia Batarisi Banasel, helping over 50,000 kids using DIM, indole 3 carbonyl with a delivery system, and iodine also helps for the skin. So I am a, a big believer in everything that it does to maximize my sexual ability also translates, I can, like... Uh, the uh, individual Napoleon Hill who wrote uh, Outwitting the Devil, he said, you could transmute your sexual energy into your business, into your career, into your relationships. So I'm not a sex addict. I just love sex because it's enjoyable and it, it releases over 30 different centers in the brain when we <laughs> orgasm. Some men should not orgasm every time they make love, uh, maybe once or twice a week as they get past 60, 70. My oldest client's 93, still active sexually. So the truth is we can do it, but I notice when the testosterone drops under about 600 down to about two, 300. If I let it get that low, I lose interest in sex. Libido goes away. My clients lose their ability. So in those guys, we probably need a BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement, but I'm a big believer in using the herbs first. The sleep is huge for hormone replacement and growth hormone. Without enough growth hormone, you don't get a, a large firm erection. Uh, IGF, I keep my levels about 190. I think I put them in the, the show notes here uh, while we were talking, all my lab levels, because uh, I, you have to track them closely about every three to six months, blood and 24 hour urine. If you're not doing 24 hour urine, you're missing the estrogen metabolites. And that's where the danger is not in the blood. You won't see it in estradiol. It'll be in 16 alpha hydroxyestrone and various herbs knock that out. And I use a live detox. I learned from a Dr. Chi and he basically talked about using turmeric and asparagus and cypress and it works. It stops the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. We're an estrogen dominant society. My book was in a huge detail on this uh, disease hacking. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it up, your, your questions. So no, most people, I don't think, have to add salt or sodium to their diet. There are a few, but, but it's rare. Uh, in terms of iodine, you have to check your levels. I mean, many people are, are deficient, but I'll, I'll warn, if, if you're eating lots of seaweeds, except for nori, most of the seaweeds have like a thousand percent of the RDA. So you, you need to dose it correctly. In terms of other supplements, most people need to be on vitamin D, vitamin B12. You can check your levels. And I'm a big fan of nitric oxide supplements like Cardio Miracle. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll go next. Salt, I think, we, I think our average intake is seven grams and we need about two. So salt is, is essential. Sodium is essential. Chloride is essential but uh, we are over overdoing the salt, so, but, but salt is required. It, I, it, you can also get it from foods, but the point is we're getting too much salt, so we need to lower it. Uh, second one, iodine. I just get potassium iodide in, in crystals. 
and literally I, I eat quite a, quite a bit of uh, cruciferous vegetables and they actually are uh, processed with iodine. So what I do is I just dip my finger into the, into the crystals and every once in a while I just lick a little off my fingers. I don't measure it. In, in uh, Japan, I've, I've seen that their iodine levels are much higher. Like we do it in micrograms and they do it in like 10 milligrams a day some of them that in, in their in their traditional foods uh, in terms of supplements well the number one deficiency is omega-3s but they have to be made with health in mind if they're going to be a, a supplement 99 percent of the population doesn't get enough for optimum health the second one is probably vitamin d and the third one's magnesium so i use those uh, very consistently uh, and then the other two things, uh, digestive enzymes and probiotics. Uh, those, those are, I use them daily, those two. Uh, those are my main supplements. And in terms of sex, uh, one is testosterone and the other one's circulation. Because a lot of the aphrodisiacs are actually uh, herbs that improve circulation. Because when your circulation slows down, the place, it, it slows down most in your appendages. <laughs> so, so, and, and then, so you, you basically lose your circulation from the outside inward. So not being able to get it up is, is sometimes a, a harbinger of, of a heart attack, which will come maybe years later, but you already know that you have a circulation problem. And then of course, the best aphrodisiac of all of them is to be in love. Thank you. Gabriel? Well, I was going to say, Brian, you can go first. But uh, so I take, again, an individualized approach. Um, I think the estimates of uh, iodine that people get are too low. And I take a fair amount of iodine. We need to understand that the skin, the, the, the thyroid has 50 micrograms, the skin has 800 micrograms. The adrenals need it, the brain needs it. People, uh, research has been done to show that literally IQ increases. Uh, they did this uh, study in Indonesia uh, and they gave the fifth graders iodine and they increased their, I, their IQ by eight points in four months. Mothers who have I, uh, adequate iodine their babies have IQs 13 points higher. So we're looking at adrenals, we're talking about brain, we're looking at also pancreas, uh, and obviously thyroid. So iodine's important. I think it's way, uh, the what we need is higher than done. Now the other issue is, when I talk about salt, I don't talk about sodium chloride. That is not salt, okay? We're talking about an 82 mineral level of salt that's available in different ways. I'm not going to use different brand names, but you need those 82 minerals and the micro uh, minerals as well. So I think salt is, is a, people aren't getting enough salt of good salt, not sodium chloride. So in the morning, I'll put a little salt in my tongue. I'll put a little bit in my, I do drink in my morning drink and then kind of keep it going all day to keep uh, a certain level of the 82 mineral type salts. So that's an important piece to the, the story. It helps your hydration uh, because you can hold more fluid. Many people are dehydrated. So the minimum you want to take the uh, those 82 mineral level salt so that you can stay hydrated and improve your circulation. So that's how I look at the salt. We'll just discuss the iodine. The omega-3s, 95% um, of pregnant women are deficient in their uh, long chain omega-3s and the DHA is the kind of number one. So I think it's important that we get it. I get it uh, from where the fish get it, from the yellow algae. Okay, I don't go through the other things because anything from fish is highly contaminated. So I do recommend that for most people. I also found postpartum pregnancy, uh, 
uh, syndromes that uh, the de postpartum depression is greatly affected by a very low DHA that because the mothers give to the babies the DHA for brain development and for the senses. So I recommend that people, uh, particularly the, the postpartum depression, they take a fair amount of DHA. The ratio of DHA to EPA, about 1,200 milligrams to about 400 milligrams or 600 milligrams. That kind of two to one, three to one ratio varies to the person. So those are supplements I take. I find that in, in today's world, a lot of people are B vitamin de deficient because of their stresses, that they burn up a tremendous amount of that not just B12, I'm talking about all the B vitamins. So I do recommend that kind of supplement, a natural B12, which are low in, in terms of dose, but high in terms of potency. And radiant C, again, a high potency, but low dose C. And then vitamin D is, we know that people don't have enough vitamin D, they have 50% more lung disease. So I recommend around eight, at least 8,000 units of vitamin D a day, not 400 <laughs> units I use. And that's kind of what I roughly do for myself. And I see lots and lots of clients and I'm measuring all this in fairly good detail. We do need to understand and all deference to the lab tests, they're about 80% accurate. So we have to understand there's a, a certain amount of experimental error in the discussion, but at least it gives you a, a sense of direction. Now, testosterone is important for your brain. It's important for your heart. And uh, so I recommend a certain level of testosterone. You mentioned 600. You need it, yes, for sexual energy, but more we need it for our brain, our memory, and for our heart function. So those are different kind of perspectives on that. It's good to get a natural, like plant-based testosterone if you can. Mastering love sex is okay, good. Um, it's a and, book I wrote, John Gray endorsed, and it goes okay, into the testosterone story and the estrogen. Yeah. But you need those hormones in there. It does make a difference. Thank you. So that's the point I'm, I'm making, that we need that mix. So that's how I kind of approach it. And everybody's a little bit different and it does change a little bit with age. Um, so I'll put it like that. Thank you. Okay. So it's interesting, Stephen, you asked us about the SSS. Number one, salt. Number two, supplements. And number three, sex. So <laughs> as far as salt, I concur, sodium chloride, which is most of all of the sodiums that we use, almost every one of them, sea salt, sodium chloride. What they get from Arkansas under the ground is sodium chloride. All of this is sodium chloride. If we've known historically sodium chloride dehydrates you and actually raise, raises blood pressure because it contracts the ventricle, it contracts the capillary, so you have the same amount of blood that has to go through a smaller opening, that's why the pressure goes up. So do we need sodium? We forgot to mention uh, that it's an antiseptic. Your lymphatic system uses it. And if you don't have it, you're gonna be sick. So we do need it. So back when we created our green drinks in the early 1970s, we basically put at the base of it, what? Celery. So this is a great source of active living organic sodium. And by the way, there's never been sodium in vegetables grown in the Midwest or internal parts of continents. It's always been along the, the shorelines. So if you're growing it here in Florida, you're gonna get a lot of sodium. That's why if you notice the kind of things grow here require a lot of sodium. And by the way, it's incredibly important, but don't take table salt, sea salt, all of these things that they market and tell you sea salt's healthier. It's the same thing. It's just floating around in the ocean. <laughs> the second thing is supplements. Uh, Gabriel and I were sitting next to one another in an international conference we held on the campus here about 30 years ago. He was on one side of me, and George Malcolmus, God bless him, was on the other side. And within a two-minute period, they whispered in my ear, didn't hear one another, 
and said, did you see the Framingham study on B12? Now, up until then, we were the come to place on the planet showing vegan diets you didn't require B12. What they did is blow out of the water what I believed and everyone else believed, because they said, even today, they haven't corrected it. That standard blood test B12 testing is in in inaccurate. So this completely throw me into another tailspin. You know, the first one was, why is fruit making tumors grow? Now, the second one was a big campaign too. And I said, oh my God, this is like amazing to me. And we realize that they are not adequate. Now today with genetics and methylation problems, we understand it. We didn't know that 30 years ago. So when we're testing people, we do methylation testing when it comes to B12. And here's what we have established, not we, but the scientific community globally, that about 70% of the world's population lack B12. What I did here is look at meat eaters, fish eaters, dairy eaters, chicken eaters. They have approximately eight times more, eight, not times, that's wrong. 8% more B12 deficiency than vegans and raw vegans have the least. And we know that from Dr. Fontaine's work at Washington University in St. Louis, an Italian doctor, he flies over, he's half time as a professor there. And he was the one that looked at raw food vegans, basically didn't, why? Because we're getting bacteria on our food. It hasn't been cooked out. And what it is, it's a bacteria, it's not a B vitamin. When they discovered it, they didn't know where the hell to put it, so they put it in the B category. So B12 is an absolute essential for every man, woman, and child on earth, unless you like dementia and neurological problems and maybe a misdiagnosis for multiple sclerosis. If you like those, don't take B12. So this holiday season, give everyone B12, you know, and give a proper living food form. We extract ours from algae. The second one is algaes. Algaes were the very first life form on the planet. If you watch what I did yesterday on The Real Truth About Health, about the cutting edge <clears throat> science on bacteria and how we've now proven without a shadow of a doubt, if you're not eating a plant-based diet, your psychology and immune system are gonna go to hell. Uh, in that, I was actually showing this planet was just a big puddle of water and there was no land. And this invisible bacteria came up that was, by the way, anaerobic. So the very first life form was something that didn't need oxygen. And about a billion years later, it morphed into something called what? Blue-green algae. And blue-green algae on the opposite end created oxygen. You, I, and every other living being on the planet came from that. So this microscopic invisible algae was your oldest ancestor. Looked better than a lot of my uncles and aunts. And the fact of the matter is why I take five types of algae, but again, I have loot, you may just want to take one, is basically because it has everything in it that will ever come after it. Every single thing that will ever come in life after that you and I know, touch, feel, and taste is in that algae. It was the foundation of life on this planet. So I think algae is important. And by the way, I completely concur. We're so stressed out. You know, we think we're not as stressed as we were. We're more stressed. Look at Stanford's uh, new terminology, Zoom disease. We're more stressed today than we've ever been doing nothing, sitting on our ass and looking at other people's problems and entertaining ourselves on a screen. And our average American child's on a screen six to seven hours a day. That's outrageous. And we're stressed. We're stressed. And so you do need B vitamins. Now, I would prefer people get it from sprouted grains. I would prefer they would drink wheatgrass, but a lot of people won't do that. So take a food based form, and there's big, wonderful companies out there that make raw uh, food-based forms of B vitamin complex. And so that would be it. Far as sex, I wrote the book on it. It's called The Seven Ways to Lifelong Sexual Vitality, one of my 30 books. And by the way, it was the most popular book. Doesn't matter, I can teach people to walk on water and reverse catastrophic disease. People wanna know how to make love. <laughs> I had more, inter I, the only time I turned interviews away in my life on television and radio was when that book came out. And that's the science of it. So we give the science of it. I completely concur with this wonderful doctor who's making love to his, his, his wife or his girlfriend two times a day. The more, I, I can't ask Anna Marie to do that, she'd, she'd cut it off. But the reality is, the more you make love, the more viable you are. I also concur with the fact you don't have to have your sex energy going only for sex. So if you look at people who, by the way, are the top 
leaders in the world and the top athletes and the top actors and actresses in the world. They all have a big sex drive, but they're channeling it not to make love 24 hours a day, but they're channeling it for passionate things they do. Passion is passion. Either you can explore your passion with a, an intimate partner, or you can explore your passion doing what we do and seemingly all loving this. So I'm a big fan of, of, of sex. It's not dirty. I was taught as a kid it was dirty. As soon as they told me that, I knew it must have been good. I didn't know what sex was, but I surely wanted to know immediately after that. Number two, it keeps you viable. Somebody mentioned Asia. Asia, it's very common. 90-year-old couples are making love on a daily basis. Do you realize in the United States and Canada and most of Western Europe, 50% of our youngsters at 40 years old, we're not talking about 70 or 40-year-old youngsters are basically unable to make love. They have erectile dysfunction. And I completely concur with Udo. If you have a libido problem, you have a heart problem, you have a brain problem. Because the same oxygen-rich blood, nutrient-rich blood goes to all of those areas. So when we invented something called Circulation Max, which superseded anything on the market, I worked with a PhD up in Canada, triple PhD. Basically, what we figured out is that your libido came back and we wanted to help people's heart. But everyone, everyone, every doctor I knew I gave it to to test was calling me back and saying they want it more than they finally told me why. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just a footnote about the B12. The key word is human act of B12. There's a lot of B12 kind of like substances, but it's human act of B12 is what we really have to make sure we get as a, a supplement. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, if you had like to ask a question, raise your hand and just ask one direct question. Jeanette, where are you from? And would you like to ask a question? Yes, hi. I had lot, I have lots of questions, but I'll ask one. Um, but this late, latest, latest conversation is interesting too. But back to soaking nuts, and seeds, um, how actually do you do that? And how do you use them afterwards? I would assume that when you soak the nuts, you can just soak them, drain it off and then eat them. What about seeds, black seed and chia seeds and whatever, what's the best way to eat those? Gabriel, why don't you take that? Well, okay. So it's important to soak nuts and seeds. It gets out a lot of the phytins, things that block the activity so soaking, as was mentioned also by Nick, is really important to do. So that's number one piece there. I like to soak them in at least 3% hydrogen peroxide. Why? Because there's often on the nuts and seeds, particularly walnuts, there's a tendency to have more fungus. So, and that kind of oxygenates it too. So that's another consideration. How long? Well, generally we soak it overnight. It's no big deal. You just soak it overnight. But that's the point I'm making. So, so you can do it overnight or you can do it for a half hour. I prefer do it at night, prepare your food, let it soak overnight. So that's kind of the, the, the simple answer. Now, chia seeds, it's different. Use really high quality water and they kind of turn to a gel, which is actually good for bowel function and so forth. And chia seeds are very, again, high in, in, in the long chain omega-3s. Short so, chain. Short chain. Short chain omega-3s. Sorry, they don't. They, they, but if they you get enough of them. The long chain. Yeah. But if you get enough of them, you, they, your body makes all the EPA and DHA that you need and all right. the other derivatives. That's what was in my mind when I said that. That's I I, think, I, I, I read your mind. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> Remember, you have to forgive this, guys, in the middle of the night. <laughs> it's 4 a 4 30 a.m holy smokes <laughs> not quite the middle but <laughs> thank you so anyway the point is it's really simple and i strongly recommend you soak your nuts and seeds it just pulls the, the toxins and also the phytons out of it so it's they're much more assimilated Max, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Yes, I am from California. Uh, many of you say that you should not take oil unless you have deficiency in omega-3. I take daily five tablespoons.
spoon of uh, grind flaxseed, but still have a severe de deficiency of omega-3 score one out of five. How would you recommend to improve it? Take oil. It's very, yeah, it's simple. You know, the, 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 um, I, when I did my test, I could not get my skin. I could not get enough, uh, omega-3 just from seeds alone so take the seeds because there's really good nutrition if you need more then 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 you take it in a more concentrated form and then you take it as an oil but the oil needs to be done, made with health in mind because omega-3s and e and six are very easily damaged so you can't just do it with canola oil or or soybean oil because they're damaged oils so it has to be done uh they have to be yeah, they basically have to be made with health in mind. And by oh, the way, just one, the other thing is that when you take algae for DHA, those algae are not coming out of the ocean. In the ocean, they only have 4% fat. They're grown in tanks. And then the oil is made with the same drain of window washing acid bleached and fried like the cooking oils are. So it is better to get your, your omega-3s from plant-based sources. And if you optimize your intake, your body will do the conversion from infancy, from pre-infancy to old age. The body, every cell that has a nucleus has the genes to do it, and the body knows how to do that. And uh, the research that they showed that men don't convert was actually done wrong. That's a long story, so I don't want to get into it, but I think it's an important point to make. I think it's important when you soak your nuts and seeds that after they start to sprout and you've poured off the anti-enzyme property, as I mentioned with, with nuts, you see this brownish color that should be poured off. According to Dr. Howell, that actually depletes your enzymes and it was done with animal studies. It harmed the animals. So we pour that off and that's why the anti-enzyme allows seeds to exist and nuts from uh, Egypt, 4,000 years old, and they germinate once they get exposed to water. So you do have to germinate. And then I agree, I think the hydrogen peroxide mixed in with the water, what 3% you mentioned, uh, Gabriel. But I, I would also say that I put mine in the refrigerator. I noticed that after they've sprouted, they last a lot longer. And I do a lot of broccoli sprouts. I do a lot of broccoli sprouts. And uh, I do lentil uh, bean sprouts and I, I just really mix it up. And then I, I put those into my big salads. My salads are humongous. They're as big as ancient African cultures where they need a huge bowl of food. And Dr. Burkett proved that they were free of digestive disorders, heart disease, cancer. The bigger the poops, the lower the disease rates, right? So a frequent uh, bowel movements, 100 to 120 grams is my goal. But usually I, I border on about 60 grams of fiber a day, just even pushing to get hickam on certain vegetables, just extraordinarily high in fiber, uh, green papaya, high in fiber. And you'll notice after you eat these foods, you, you're able to excrete a bowel movement almost after every meal, three or four times a day. So I think the soaking and putting them in the refrigerator helps because then it preserves them. And I pull them out and put them into my mixed foods. And I, I'm always got live food going along with my cooked crock pot, which I keep going for three days or longer because people don't like beans because they cause gas. But if you cook them long enough, the lectins disappear and you can uh, absorb them and tolerate and get all the benefit of those beans as well. So your, your diet should be very mixed up. And I would be remiss if I didn't say you must have some kind of a probiotic food, some kind of a fermented food. I have some uh, fermented uh, string beans here. I fermented chilies. I have fermented um, uh, jicama, all kinds of fermented things. I, I'm lucky I live up the street from fermented farms. They do it all for me. That's a lot of work. I, I take the time to do fermented uh, uh, yogurt and, and co coconut yogurt, never dairy yogurt, right? So all these things are critical. It's equally as important what you don't put in your body is what you put in your body, but you've got to get, like our ancient uh, relatives ate about 700 different biodiversity fibers. We, we're lucky to figure out 30 different fibers of food. So, you know, just remember that biodiversity, uh, the, the juicing. And I think, uh, again, putting cold pressed juice from these big $30,000 machines that do a better job than I could do with an Omega juicer. And then I drop that in the Vitamix and I put in some carrots and yams, whole, whole yams. And I peel them, but I, I blend them. So I get that added fiber and protein, vitamins and minerals, untainted protein from yams, raw. But I'm getting a lot of density. So if you're trying to go raw, the only way you can do it and answer that original question is you'd have to blend uh, a lot of, of yams and beets and carrots to get the nutrient density. And I believe it's possible. It's just not easy because like most raw foodists, they end up having a lot of fruit and a lot of uh, 
uh, avocados and nuts and things like that. But, you know, if you get the right mix and you're, you're training and you're eating a little bit more often, I carry food with me every day for 45 years. I don't leave it to chance at airports. I went to the Long Beach uh, uh, Grand Prix today with my son. I had a whole big bowl of fresh food and we were eating while everyone was eating junk. Everywhere you go, everyone eats junk. It's our society. It's corrupted. It's horrible. And drugs and alcohol were still open when COVID shut down and churches were shut down. What in the world do we live in? So guys, we got to stand up for ourselves. And particularly you have control over two things, what goes into your mouth and whether you accept a kiss or not. So I hope you're accepting a lot of kisses and hugs and you're eating the right food and exercising because Brian's right. Every book I ever wrote on love and lovemaking, you've got to get this one point. It's the biggest miscommunication for divorce. Laura Langmeyer says it's financials number one, but I'll say number two, and, and I think John Gray would agree with me, is when um, the study was done by by, uh, Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey hired four gynecologists to examine 900 women. He found zero pleasure nerve endings inside the vagina. So everyone who thinks intercourse is the way to go, you know, will reduce unnecessary pregnancies. We can e easily ejaculate outside of the vagina, but you have to please a woman first. And uh, I'm the first to say, besides my book, She Comes First by Ian Curran and, you know, oral sex, water sex. People say, oh, but what about the microbes? If you have a healthy biodiversity, you have every kind of microbe in your body. Your body handles it. I have regular STD tests. My tests come up clear, even though I've gone down on so many times, I, I won't even get into detail, but it's such a healthy thing. You actually get vitamin B12 from going down on a vagina up there. True, Brian? Vitamin B12. Absolutely. I can. That was I did a two hour lecture yesterday on the real truth about that. And let me it. tell you, the only question I have for your doc, yeah. what does a fermented chili taste like? I've never had one of those. Yeah, it's really we, good. We, it's we really do good. a lot of fermenting, including fermented chilies. Uh, kimchi is also very good. I strongly recommend weaving that into your diet rather than necessarily acidophilus. So we're the fermented foods are a very good way to go, including chilies. You got to yeah. have a lot of cilantro. They taste hot. Your breath breath's a little strong for your honey, right? You know, but otherwise it's <laughs> really important for the gut. Uh, yeah. And the chili depends on the taste, the type of chili. Sometimes they're hotter, like jalapeno chilies fermented, or they're a, a pico de gallo type chili. I try, I love chilies because the longest lived people also have a lower infectious disease rate because their lungs are clear because they're coughing up things. That chili helps to expedite, uh, express all these junk in people's lungs. You have to have clear lungs, breathe through your nose when you're exercising, not through your mouth, uh, become a nasal breather. That's a big breath. We haven't even talked about that, right? Really important. So while you're making love, you got to learn how to breathe through your nose while you're licking and everything's going to be good. Okay. If everyone would give a final 30 second wrap up of your final thoughts and how people can get in touch with you, stay in touch with you, uh, get your books going forward. Well, I'll start. I have written 13 books. You can go to drcousins.com or treeoflife.mn.co. And my big message is, what's our purpose of life? And we should eat in a way that supports that purpose. So for me, the key is eating in a way that you become a superconductor of the divine. It enhances your communication with the divine. Now, I'm a 99% live food uh, vegan person, and you can get stronger and more healthy and more flexible with age. That's why I made the point about the 2,000 push-ups and the 100 pull-ups and all that. That's with age, getting better. So we also need to take, uh, let go of the thought form that you get weaker, less fertile, less... Uh, energetic with age and understand we can improve with age. So, but the main point for me is eating in a way that I have constant energy and it's all helping me become a superconductor of the divine. That's how I look at it. That's Thank the you. purpose part of it. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, it, it, to to uh, summarize, eat whole plants and avoid oil um, and 
what else? You, you can learn more at drjosh.com, drjosh.com, and check your toxin levels, your petrochemicals, your uh, DDT levels, etc. It's real, it's important, and it's been a pleasure to be part of this panel. And thanks again to Steve for organizing this. Thank you. And again, all the bios and on the way, if you go to the real truth about health.com to the bios of each of these speakers and click on it, it has their website information. And if you go to books, it has their books. I just want to support one point. When we eat lower on the food chain, uh, we get significantly less pesticides and herbicides. The pesticides and herbicides are in the animal fat higher up on the food chain. So we naturally are going to go way less with the toxins in our system by eating lower. Yeah, and then I agree because the higher you go up, the bigger the fish, the bigger the animal, the more the toxins. It, it it's, it's actually concentrates over a million times more toxins when you're eating animals instead of, compared to plant-based food. So my new book coming out for anyone who likes, just email nickdphd at gmail.com. You'll get disease hacking. I have the book, Blood Doesn't Lie at, on Amazon, Acting Be Gone for Good on my website and Amazon, Mastering Love, Sex and Intimacy, Amazon and my website, nickdelgado.com and Simply Healthy Cookbook, Oil-Free Recipes that I've traveled all over the world. It took me 15 years to gather these recipes. People love the food. We did food demonstrations at the end of six weeks and people, when they first had the food to eat uh, at, in our classes the first week, they weren't used to the no sugar, the no oil. And by the sixth week, they said, oh, this is a wonderful recipe. Try my recipe. It was the same as our recipes in our cookbook, people's taste buds must adapt. It takes about six weeks to get off the addictions to sugars and, and fatty, greasy stuff. Brian, where'd you go? You look like you're ready let to him, go. No, let Udo go first. Okay, Brian. <laughs> All right. Okay, if you want to have the longest, highest quality most healthy life, then you need to do whatever it takes to live in line with all of your nature and in line with nature. And there's eight parts to that. Um, and, and fundamentally the, on, the, on the food part, fresh, whole, raw, organic, mostly plant-based, and maybe at one point it, it'll need to become local again as well. Uh, it, and, and, I, and, and in terms of what needs to be in that food, it should be the foundation has to be whole foods. And there are a number of add-ons and definitely oils have in, in my experience been a very powerful add-on for especially for energy, for skin, for pregnancy, for athletic performance, uh, well, for liver and kidney function, for heart function, I mean, literally they play roles in every cell in the body and they're essential for health, both omega-6 and omega-3 in the right ratio, made with health in mind, packaged in glass because oils actually leach, leach uh, like plastic leaches into oils and you don't want that in your body. Thank you. I'll start <clears throat> number one by thanking you, Stephen. Um, this is the ninth year you've done this. You've dedicated your life to this. So I wanna just take a moment to honor you with all of this panel that it's been a delight to be with, but all of the people listening all over the world. Thank you, yes. Stephen, you're much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Thank you. This, this, the state of life was never meant to have disease and disorder, discord and disharmony. You know, what's going on right now as we, we stream this globally is unconscionable, where literally savagery is occurring. Um, what has happened to all of humanity over the last two years is unthinkable and criminal activity at the highest level yep. that I equate to the worst warriors uh, the, the, the insane people who have created the worst wars throughout history. I think it's equal to that. I think humanity is lost and we've become more sheep-like than we've become you know, independent and responsible. And if you know anything about scripture, I've read all of it, every type you can imagine I can get my hands on. 
Uh, the one commonality is they all say we're made in the image of God. Well, it doesn't look like we're living at a godly level now. To me, it looks like the opposite, to be honest with you. But I'm still an optimist because I see when things get really bad, uh, they will rebound. But it's going to take some courage. It's going to take you realizing that every choice you make, the thought, number one, the first choice you make is what you think and how you process your thoughts. And then, of course, when you get that balanced, you'll know what to eat because you won't be thinking intellectually anymore. Your heart is going to lead you to what, into what to eat. I finally looked back at my history, and that's what happened. Uh, I read all I could read. And I didn't always agree with it, but I couldn't disagree with my own heart. And the next thing we have to understand is longevity doesn't only come from eating and exercise and positive attitude. If you look at the most important study ever done on longevity, centenarians and super centenarians, they looked at 1,710-year-old people. It was a New England study. And they actually now, thank God, I honor them so much to say community is just as important as being a vegan and exercising. Sure, we vegans all champion veganism. Yeah, but if you don't have somebody to share life with, and I'm not just talking about intimate partners, friends. Look at the study that was done at Brigham's. Uh, and they basically showed people who were lonely throughout life died generally 15 years sooner than the rest of them. That's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. So we're finally growing up and maturing in the scientific community at some level, at least, at least some of the scientists. It's not always being propelled by who writes the largest check and gives it to the biggest university. And, you know, it, it's sad for me because I love to read research. And over the last 20 years, I've only been looking at meta studies because you really can't trust independent studies. Uh, the first question I always ask, is, who funded that study? So when they say coffee is good, guess who funds that study? When they say alcohol is good, who funds that study? You know, and so it's great for my colleagues to always say they want empirical evidence and it's, it's foolproof. Uh, you know, I take that with tongue in cheek. I think practicing with humility and practicing with integrity, not that we're going to ever be perfect, really brings you to a place where you see things much clearer. And when you see things clearer, you don't always need somebody else to tell you what to do. You start to be a big boy and a big girl, and you know what to do. So God bless you, Stephen. God bless the real truth about health. And God bless all of these men that are dedicating their life to help all of you change yourself in the world that we live in. Yeah. Could we thank unmute you. everyone thank so we could well thank everyone so we can thank everyone? <laughs> this has been fantastic. Thank you, Brian. 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 Brian.